Welcome to uh, this uh, public information session. I'm pleased to see such a large turnout. Uh, just to go through a few uh, things first as far as housekeeping rules and whatnot are concerned. And you all should have a copy of the agenda, uh, so I won't go through that. But for the housekeeping purposes, um, just to point out the exits uh, in the event that we have to vacate the building, um, we have two exits at the front, and they are not blocked outside, so that should not pose any impediment. Uh, you have the door that you came in, and you know, so that's another exit. And of course, the washrooms are out in the hall. I would also ask that if you have any cell phones, you either put them on mute or turn them off, please. And the pastor wanted me to remind you that this was a free admission. Uh, there may be a free will offering if you want to get back out the door. Is that correct, pastor? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Also, uh, you'll see in the center aisle, uh, there is a microphone. Uh, the, uh, the meeting this evening is being videotaped. Uh, and I would ask that uh, when speaking, you come uh, to the microphone and ask your question there. Although this is not a formal council meeting, uh, there are some rules I think we should abide by uh, in the, uh, for protocol and to ensure that the meeting runs smoothly. I would ask that if there are any, any questions that you do have to ask, if you would run it through the chair Mayor Henderson and I will be chairing this meeting. I'll take it for a short period of time. The Mayor Henderson will take it uh, for a short period of time as well. Uh, so I just ask that you direct your questions through the chair. Obviously, they will be responded to by the appropriate people from uh, Radical. Um, with those few remarks, oh, and one other is uh, rather than having one person stand up and ask five, six, seven, eight questions, I'm asking for your cooperation much like we do at council, and if you could ask your question with a supplementary, then I'd like to move through the audience so everyone has an opportunity to ask at least one question. Once we've gone through and everyone's had an opportunity to speak or ask a question, then we can go back through again. Again, I ask that you line up uh, at, the, uh, at the microphone. It just helps to keep some semblance of order. Are there any questions so far? I think I've covered it all. So what I'd like to do is to open up with a, a brief uh, comment, and then Mayor Henderson uh, will uh, also have a brief comment, and then we'll turn it over for the presentation from Radical. And uh, I understand it's uh, probably about 20 minutes, 25. After the presentation, uh, perhaps then, I, we will certainly entertain any questions. Uh, or any comments that you might have. All right. Thank you very much for your attention. And let's get into the meeting. The bit of background, and I, with your permission, I'm going to sit down. I don't need for me to stand for, as I speak, so if you're comfortable with that, I will sit down just a little more comfortable and take some pressure off these old legs. Just a bit of background from our perspective at the township, um, and that is township council and staff attended a meeting in January 2015 where information was provided by Radical Ventures Canada regarding their proposed development at the airport property. And that meeting was held in Brockville with Brockville Council. And at that time, it was noted that it would be a specialized security company, a center of excellence for training, with its headquarters being stationed there at the, uh, at the airport. It was estimated that between 20 and 40 full-time jobs and 40 part-time jobs could be created through this endeavor. At the August 10th meeting of uh, Township Council, Radical attended to provide an update on the development. And at that time, 
an overall draft property development concept plan. And so it was a, only a, a concept plan was shown to those in attendance to see what was being planned for the, uh, for the property. And a copy of this plan, however, was not provided uh, to the township, provided those who have attended some of our council meetings, I believe I mentioned it was, I think it was on a whiteboard that was presented and, and passed around. I'd like to touch just briefly on our zoning bylaw. There has been some concerns and comments made regarding public input into our comprehensive zoning bylaw change that was completed in 2013 and uh, the uh, current airport industrial zone, which is the MAP zone in our zoning bylaw. And it should be noted that the township reached out to the public for their input a total of nine times from 2011 until the notice of passing in May of 2013. And I won't go into the details, but I have them available uh, if you want to know those dates. The township was asked early in the process to provide information on the zoning applicable to the airport property and if the proposed training facility would be in compliance with the comprehensive zoning bylaw. The township's plan of confirmed compliance as the intended use fits under the definition of an instructional facility under the MAP zoning, uh, the airport zoning. Now there has been subsequent to um, the meetings, uh, we did receive a letter uh, from a resident of the township requesting uh, a reconsideration of the definition and its interpretation related to the use and the staff report addressing this request will be coming to council in the near future for council's consideration. Staff did reach out to a third uh, party for a review of the interpretation and um, this was done by a professional planner and uh, the interpretation from this third party has confirmed the township's initial interpretation on the instructional facility. Briefly about the site plan, and you've heard me, if you've attended any of the council meetings, you've heard me talk about site plan. <coughs> site plan approval is triggered by a building and is not subject to public consultation as per the Planning Act. The township does have a custom whereby bylaws which have not been subject to a public notification or meeting uh, process uh, that are under consideration by council, uh, such as the site plan agreement bylaw, are to be given only first and second reading at any meeting in order to introduce the bylaw to the public and to permit time for the public to commence, comment prior to the third reading. And in keeping with this custom, Upon receipt of the site plan application on July 31st, staff included the first and second reading of the airport site plan agreement bylaw on September 14th council agenda. The site plan indicated only an indoor firing range at 4,800 square meters in size. That's all that was put forward in that site plan was that one building. This site plan agreement has not moved forward the township has asked for further information regarding stormwater management and property access. Uh, and as noted previously, council has not yet seen a final overall site plan outlining all aspects of this proposal. I won't, I've got some other notes here which I'm just going to skip over. I think I've spoken enough right now, but I'm prepared if, if any questions come up or if you want a copy of my notes, I'm certainly prepared to, to make them available to you at the end of the meeting. So with those few comments, I'll uh, turn the microphone over to Mayor Henderson for his comments. Sure, and it's a little bit of a different type of setup that we're doing. We're co-hosting a public meeting. It's not a statutory public meeting, but it's an information session Clearly, there is a demand for information from the public. And hopefully, some of my comments will give some context to where we're at. And then we're going to hear a lot of the details from Reticle itself, or more details. Probably never enough information. First of all, and I say that only in the sense that we always want more. And it's not always available. Give a little context to start off. Many of you may not understand fully our relationship with the airport. The city of Brockville owns the airport. It's 400 acres plus of property that is commercially zoned primarily. There's a whole marshland area on it 
that we as an airport try to keep drained. That airport was expanded approximately 10 years ago at a million plus dollars. In this process, and I know the comment was made in an earlier public meeting about caring, and to give you an idea, we do care. And this is how important this is to us and the entire area, is part of this process is a $250,000 investment in the airport to try and make this process work and make jobs in this area. The airport itself, uh, we actually license people to hunt year round on site to keep animals away from the airport. We use bangers on site to keep birds away from the airport. Uh, according to all the zoning, it's appropriate for this type of use and we've heard the double review by professional planners of the interpretation. So our role is the owner of the property. Our role is to try and lease that property and sell fuel. Our role is to try and maximize the usage of that property to develop jobs. It's not in the city, it's outside of the city, but it's our region. And these jobs are important because in the greater context for us, simple fact over two census periods, the township had a population decline of 10%. The city was static, which is not good either. The region had a decline. It's all one region. We can't keep doing the same things. We have to invest. We understand that. So that's context of where we're coming from on this process. Early on in the process, and these are the, some of the concerns that were expressed directly to me uh, about activities on the site. We allowed Reticle to get on the site, cut a trail through, do some testing. We authorized that. We would do that to anybody that asked if they were a potential customer. Early on, they asked us how they should start getting the word out to people in the neighborhood. And we said, well, there are processes that deem a 200 meter neighborhood area of contact for different zoning issues. Start with that. Contact the people within 200 meters. That's where they got that idea to do, to contact those people, to start the process, start talking, start communicating. The challenge is they have to do a lot of the homework behind the scenes before they put something on deck. You can't put it on deck without doing the homework. That's where everybody gets worried because you think that things are going on secretly behind the scenes. They have to do the homework before they present anything. We wanted them to do the homework, do the due diligence, find out their information. Through this entire process, they have to abide by all regulatory agencies, whether it's the CRCA, the firearms officials, the Transport Canada, NAVCAN, and those discussions are not finished. There's still further discussions with Transport Canada and NAVCAN. They have to abide by all regulatory requirements. That's part of what we require, that they meet all those requirements, health and safety rules. In this process, Safety is a given. We're not going to accept an operation on our property that is not safe. It has to be safe. That's a ground-based level. In the discussions that we've heard so far, a lot of it seems to boil down to the noise. And at what point, how far does the proponent have to go to mitigate the noise levels so that it's sound and not noise? We don't know. We're looking towards the process of the site plan to see what mitigation steps the proponent is going to put in place, where they'll put the range, where will it be accepted by both the township and by the regulatory bodies, and what that means to the noise and sound. Part of the process, because we accept that Reticle has to work through the site plan process with the township. We have agreed with everybody that we're working with Reticle and the township on going forward. So if the township accepts this process, we accept this process. We're working together on it, but we are encouraging them that jobs in this area are important. We subsidize the airport $90,000 a year. That's how much we pay right now. The lease that we are working on with Reticle, there's a number of actual leases. They're not forwarded to council yet. 
they're subject to this meeting we said we'd have a public meeting and they're subject to further feedback from the township but then it has to be approved by city council and brockville i think that's just about it that i've got give you a little context of where we're coming from steve i think we're turning it over to you <coughs> Um, thank you very much, Your Worships, uh, councillors, local civic leaders, and local uh, city and township citizens. I'd just like to start off by saying we very much appreciate the opportunity this evening to present an update to all concerned on our discoveries over the last four months and uh, the last, hopefully, months moving forward. We hope these facts, as we understand them to date, will alleviate some of the concerns that have been raised and we have been listening. And we do appreciate your patience, and we do appreciate as well some of your, your, your concerns. That said, uh, I am a realist, and I know that we can't possibly please everybody, but we are striving to listen to what you have to say and adjust our plans as we move forward. My intention now is to hand over to Mr. Bryce uh, Jeffrey, who is going to moderate the 20-minute uh, the, the uh, discussion, or sorry, present the 20-minute discussion on our behalf, and then we'll be prepared to take questions, any number of questions that you may wish to pose in accordance with uh, the mayor's uh, direction earlier. Thank you. Bryce? Thanks, Steve. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Steve said, my name is Bryce Joffrey. Um, I'm the general counsel for uh, Reticle, and uh, just uh, I'll start off by telling you what I'm going to tell you tonight, or what we're going to tell you collectively. Uh, There's going to be two main parts to this. We're going to have a presentation, and uh, we're also going to have a, a Q&A. <laughs> Um, so the presentation is going to be divided into some parts and what, what we're going to do is try and bring you folks up to speed a, a little bit uh, in each uh, specific area to help you get a, a big picture of what we're doing. So we're going to talk about what, what is Radical as a company, who are the people involved behind Radical, uh, and then who have we been working with, what government groups have we been interacting with, uh, the experts that Radical has had to go out and retain to work through the system, uh, what is the plan? Everyone's very interested in that. We understand that. And uh, I think you'll also be interested to learn how that's changed over time, because it has changed over time based on the working through the system, our interaction with the various governments, uh, agencies, our interaction with the people in the community as well. And then we'll talk about what comes next. So uh, the goal here tonight is to uh, provide some uh, facts and address concerns. All right. Can everyone hear me okay? No. Now you can. All right. Sorry about that. Don't be afraid to put your hand up. Yeah, yeah. If, if I start to lose anybody, if I go too quickly or if you can't hear me, raise your hand and I'll stop. This is important stuff. We understand that. And you, you folks took your time to come out here tonight. So I uh, want to make sure that you get the information you're entitled to. Okay? And when I put my glasses on, I can hardly see anybody back there, too. Right now, you're all crystal, crystal clear, but when, I need them to read, so sorry. All right. So uh, what we're going to do, then, is we're going to walk through uh, a, a prepared presentation and then take your questions at the end. So start off uh, with who, who we are, who's radical. And I'm sure uh, you've heard a lot of things, uh, some of it uh, accurate, some of not. Uh, but this is a Canadian company, 100% Canadian company, privately owned. Uh, and the senior people in Radical are all uh, former Canadian Forces uh, officers. And uh, the vast majority of them were involved in special operations too. National security experts, uh, long careers, serving their country, uh, now retired from the forces, and looking in their private lives now to address some holes uh, in the uh, system that need to be filled. There are some requirements that we know, and not as much myself, uh, but Steve and the others, based on their past experience, things that should be done that can make uh, the lives of the people who are serving Canada as police officers, as firefighters, as first responders, as service members, better and easier, and keep training dollars in Canada. So that's what we're, that's radical as a company. And I'm not going to read all the slides to you folks as well too. You can read just as well as I can, but I'll just talk a little bit about what we're, what we're doing. So who works at radical? Now everybody I think at this point in time has a pretty good idea who Steve is. Uh, Steve's the face of the company. Steve is the uh, CEO of the company. He's the majority shareholder of the company. Uh, he's a retired Colonel from the Canadian Armed Forces. Steve was the commanding officer of JTF2. Uh, he's uh, an engineer, 
uh, and he's a father, and he's a husband. Uh, Eric is here as well tonight, Eric Tupan, who's sitting up at the front. Uh, Eric is a retired Canadian Armed Forces Captain. He does accounting work now. Uh, he's a hockey dad, uh, I know, because I spend time and I work with Eric all the time. He's got two young sons, and he spends most of his time running back and forth to hockey rinks this time of year. Uh, we also have with us uh, John Day, who is a retired Air Force Master Warrant Officer. He acts as the site supervisor, and he's Steve's dad, and he's the guy that basically keeps us all in line. He, John is the guy that tells us what to do, and we do it. And that's how it works, right? I'm, uh, like I mentioned, I'm a lawyer. Um, I've been a lawyer for 25 years. I own a home on Charleston Lake. I bought it in 1999. I used to have a, an office up in Athens at McCann's store for a number of years. Um, I call this area home, and uh, I was in the Armed Forces Reserve for over 16 years, and I'm a commissioned officer, retired as well. So those are the radical people that are here tonight, but we also, what we did is we brought along some other people because we've had a lot of uh, outside folks helping us as well. And the idea behind this is rather than uh, us come away with, in case we haven't answered all your questions tonight or we don't have all the information here to answer the questions, we brought some of our subject matter experts with us. The idea being if you get up and ask a question tonight and it's something we don't know the answer to, the people who can get that information for us are sitting here, and then what we're going to do is we're going to get that information and push it back out to the community, likely via email or some other means, but, but, but we're going to work that out. I know when uh, Eric and I went to the uh, information session a few weeks ago, uh, Brant Burroughs was there, and I spoke with his brother, and they were kind enough to uh, speak with me and give me the link to where they posted uh, their video of their session online. So I thought if I communicated back through him, he could make sure that any information that we wanted to pass on got all, out to all the right people in the community and we weren't going to miss anybody. But again, open to suggestion, that's just kind of what we were thinking about doing. So some of the people that uh, we brought here with us tonight is uh, Nadia DeSanti, and she's sitting in the front row. She's a senior planner and a project manager for planning and environmental des design with a company called MMM Group out of Ottawa. And we at Reticle hired her to assist us with our site plan preparation and the issues related to that. Uh, with her tonight is uh, Ted Lennox, and he's a, a senior aviation planner, also from the MMM group. He's got over 40 years experience in designing airports and por parts of airports, and he's helping us with our flight line and hangar construction issues. Uh, we've also got some people in the crowd tonight who are very experienced uh, shooters and who are experts on ballistics because we knew that that came up at different points in time. So if there are any questions that we can't answer tonight, those people are here and they'll be able to provide us with some background information on that as well. We also have tonight uh, Jeff Clark with us. Uh, Jeff has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and a master's degree in biomedical engineering. And he says in practice, he's an instrumentation and signal processing engineer. Translating that into English, he means he specializes in measuring things. And we know something that's a concern to people around here is noise. So what he's been hired to do, in part with Reticle, and he's actually been hired as an employee by Reticle since September of this year, is to help us employ the best methods and practices to reduce any sound that's going to be generated from all of the operations that are going to take place at the airport. We also have tonight uh, with us uh, Matt Brinkerhoff. And uh, Matt uh, has come all the way from Provo, Utah. And the reason that Matt is here is he came to take a look at the site because uh, Reticle is uh, in the process of purchasing uh, from his company a lead containment and recycling system, a bullet catcher. So what happens if you go out on the range and if you shoot and if you miss the target, and we're going to actually show you some pictures of this tonight, there's a big thing behind it where the bullets go in and they're captured and they're eventually taken for recycling. And his company, he told me, has installed over 500 of those systems across North America, both in Canada and the United States, and most of the major police forces in uh, Ontario uh, who have their own ranges utilize that exact same system. So what, what we wanted to do is just give you a little bit of a background. You might have heard that they got, you had a bunch of soldiers coming to town that they wanted to do some things and they were trying to run roughshod over the community. Not true at all. 
And as the mayors, I think, quite uh, fairly stated, that this is a very complex process that we're working through. Uh, we're, we've got a bunch of subject matter experts that we're bringing in to help us do this and do it the right way. And one of Steve's favorite uh, expressions is he refuses to rush to failure. And if there's been some frustration, if it seems like it's taking a long time, it is taking a long time because it's not an easy thing to do. And it's really not an easy thing to do the right way. So we're hoping that you'll continue to bear with us as we work through this process and we can try to give you as much information as possible. So next thing I want to talk about is actually who are we working with? And again, uh, the mayor, I think it was Mayor Henderson, alluded to the fact that we're not done yet. We are still working through some uh, meetings uh, with various government agencies in order to do things the right way. And we simply can't go out and start doing whatever we like. There's multiple levels of government agencies we're dealing with. The city of Brockville as the landowner. The township as the persons who have the jurisdiction over the lands. Uh, we've also had meetings with both the provincial and the federal members of parliament for the areas. There's been meetings ongoing with the Ministry of Environment. We've, we've been having discussions with the Cataract Lake Conservation Authority. Many discussions with the Chief Firearms Officer of Ontario with respect to range construction, with respect to safety measures, with respect to licensing of our proposed business. We're also dealing with Nav Canada and Transport Canada because it's an airport. And we have to make sure that what we're doing is done in the right way with respect to the airplanes flying in and out of there. So that's all of the various agencies we've been dealing with. So who do we have? I've, I told you about some of the people that are here tonight to listen as well. The lawyer, always the necessary evil, that would be me. Uh, we've got a surveyor, we've got a planner, we've got an environmental consultant, a scientist to help us deal with noise mitigation, shooting and ballistics experts, the lead containment and recycling system company from Utah, whose representative is here, and an aviation consultant as well. So I think the mayor's point that I'd like to expand on briefly is that there are many, many layers of rules and government that have to be brought to bear with respect to this project because it's an important thing, it's at an airport, it's going to involve training, it's going to involve the discharge of firearms or a, a portion of it, therefore it has to be done the right way and we are not by any stretch of the imagination doing things or getting ahead of ourselves, we're working through a long, complicated process. Which uh, brings us to uh, where are we and what's the plan? Now, I'm going to play with this uh, laser thing just for a minute here because there are a couple things that I wanted to show you on here and just to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of where this is. And, uh, the area that is bounded by the red uh, excuse me, Bright. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, if you can either get the wireless mic or take the wired mic with you, otherwise the video won't be of much value because it, it won't pick up your, your voice in the room. Bryce. Steve. All right. Thanks, and thank you for that. No, I'm not used to talking with a microphone. Yeah. Court, we have no microphones, sir. <laughs> so, in any event, this uh, is where it says map. That's the airport lands, and this, I just wanted to touch on this briefly uh, because it's relevant in terms of the surrounding lands, and the area that is, of, I think, a lot of concern to some folks around here is this R1 designation down here, the uh, residential, which is tin cap. And uh, some of the later diagrams you're going to see, you'll actually see where the airport lies, but one thing I wanted to talk to you about right now, just for a second, although it's kind of... A, a little bit off uh, discussion is everyone's concerned about the shooting and the people that live in Tin Cap are concerned about the shooting and I think that's a very relevant concern. And I'm going to tell you this right now, uh, although I'm going to tell you again later, uh, and I'm going to come back to it, is that the direction that the shooting is going to take place is that direction out there. So there have been some changes that have been made based on some feedback that we had from the Chief Firearms Officer and also some concerns from the local citizens. So there is not going to ever be any weapons discharged down in that direction towards Tin Cap. It's going to go kind of along that line right there in that direction. And you'll see that more clearly on some uh, later do um, diagrams that we're going to show you. 
And so we're going to kind of drill down now in some of the later diagrams, and you're going to see this piece of property, and you won't see all the surrounding property. Okay, so um, what we wanted to talk about here a little bit is uh, just to put this in a little bit of context for you folks, uh, because this is not something uh, that uh, is just been sprung on you. It's been actually going on for a while. So the historical timeline is broken up into two major sections, and the break in the, uh, in the slide, uh, everything that appears above that is before Reticle came on the scene. So the, the idea is that there was the, the master site plan, it was revised, there was an expansion of the runway, a new private hangar uh, was approved, and then in September of 2014, just over a year ago, is the very first time that uh, Steve and some other people uh, came down, took a look around the airport, and uh, looked at the potential for locating the training facility here and relocating the entire business of Reticle down to this area. And then you can see there's been a process that's been ongoing that has some fairly you know, regular pieces to it. Uh, consultations, then the mayor alluded to the initial in-camera brief that took place in uh, January of 2015. And it was way back in February of 15 that Steve and I sat down for the first time with the representatives of the city of Brockville to start to talk about how we would look at leasing this land. And we've actually had some discussions and talked about dividing it into three separate sections. And then we had some considerations about the environmentally protected areas. Again, it's a work in progress. We haven't finalized that yet, but we've been chugging away at that since February. March, April, then we started to talk to the property owners, as you saw. And then the June public open house that we did based on the advice that we had been given from the city in terms of who we should invite, the people that live within a certain radius. And then... Uh, uh, we've been field studies and investigations. I'm going to drill down on that for you to let you know what we've been doing since June up to this point in time. And you're going to see it's, we've been quite busy. Uh, and then uh, in August, Steve made presentations to the two councils to provide them with some updated information in terms of where we're at. And it takes us right up till tonight. Here we are tonight with the, an opportunity to provide you with some more information and let you know where we're at. This is uh, the old plan in the sense that in June of 2015, when we had an open house at the airport, this uh, document was one that was available for people to take a look at. And I think it worried and, and scared some people. Because what this was, it, this was a diagram that was done by an American company who had never come and taken a look at the land, who is specialized in the design of training facilities and basically said, these are all of the things that you could do on these lands. So you see here that that's the runway, that's the grass one that grows across it. And there was a whole bunch of ideas in terms of putting driving areas up here in different ranges and then training areas and all these other things. And that was just to understand what, again, what Steve calls the realm of the possible. What is possible that we could do with that land? But we've moved past that at this point in time. So what is the plan? You're, you might be wondering because you've, you've heard a lot of different things from people in the community. In short, it started out as an air charter service. People are, keep saying, why here? Why Brockville? Why the airport? Because the original concept was an air charter service. Because we, and again, mostly folks like Steve and the other people that were in the Special Forces community, are very much aware of the limitations of the Canadian Air Force right now and how they can't do everything that they're supposed to do. And what happens is if the Air Force can't fill a tasking, they have to go and hire someone else to do it. And right now, that equals Americans. And there, if we can keep the money in Canada, if we can employ Canadian pilots and Canadian mechanics fixing planes, that was the original concept. And then as that idea matured, the idea was to put in a training facility as well to support the first responders, law enforcement, and select national security agencies, Canadians. You know, I've, heard, I've seen that people are worried about us bringing folks in from overseas. That's not what we're talking about. 
We're talking about police officers. We're talking about firefighters. We're talking about uh, you know some folks in uniform that might come down here. That's what we're talking about. There is a huge, huge market in Canada for that, and there's a huge requirement. And we think we can do it better to make those people safer. That's what it's really all about here. And there has never, ever been a plan to develop a military training base here, because we couldn't do that even if we wanted to. That's not our job. That's the job of the Department of National Defense. And all of us have worked for the Department of National Defense in the past, so we're, we're very clear on where those lines are drawn. So if you're hearing about a military-style training base, that's not what we're doing here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more as we work through this about what it is we're going to do, or what we're hoping to do. So here's what, what's happened between June and now. And I think that this is important too because uh, people have said, you know, why have you not been more forthcoming? Why are you keeping it to yourself? We're not. We're working through simultaneous processes with different levels of government and different re regulatory agencies on an ongoing basis. And we're doing what we're told to do. It's not up to us. So we have completed some things. You see the business plan and market study was done. We've done three rounds of sound testing out there, an environmental review and CCRA discussions. We've had the CFO, in case anybody's wondering, is the Chief Firearms Officer of Ontario. And they have the mandate to go out and make sure that anybody that wants to construct a range or discharge firearms constructs the range in accordance with their standards and guidelines. So before we built anything, we submitted all of the paperwork to the Chief Firearms Officer, and by we, I mean me, and said, this is what we would like to do. We, con we constructed the proper not-for-profit company to do that. We gave them the ideas, and we had somebody from the Chief Firearms Officer come out and physically walk around the airport with us. And we said, this is what we would like to do. And he said, well, that's not a bad idea, but if I was you guys, I'd shift the, the direction of fire this way. He had some idea about noise mitigation. He had some ideas about berm construction in order to make sure if anybody misses the target, it doesn't go flying off into the atmosphere. So based on that initial input from the chief firearms officer, we went back and modified the plan. And you're going to see in a slide or two the new plan that was based in part uh, from that feed feedback. We've also joined a, an institution called the Canadian Firearms Institute, and I completed the training for the club safety officer. Notwithstanding, all of us have served many, many years in the military, the civilian requirements for training and safety are different. So we're meeting all of those requirements as well. We've also got ongoing meetings and discussions with Transport and Navigations Canada. And as you heard, we've submitted phase one site plan application, which deals about the entrance, the temporary office facility and the indoor range. And now what we've done with the help of people at MMM and based on the feedback we've received from the township and the city of Brockville is we now have the land use concept plan, the bigger picture. Because people are saying, what, do you, what is it you guys are going to do? And this is it. And this, as you're going to see, looks very different from that original plan that had everything in it but the kitchen sink. And there's actually copies of this diagram at the back of the room and by the door that you can take a look at or take a photograph of or whatever you want on your way out because this is where we're at right now, all right? And I just wanted to speak to a couple of things on here. So that's obviously the runway there and that's the grass runway that goes across. So the existing access to the airport remains. Proposed hangar, that's where we'd like to build our hangar down there and that's not gonna come to a surprise to anybody because that's always where it's been. The current construction roadway that some of you may see that goes in is right there. Uh, we're going to actually move the, or we'd like to move the long-term <coughs> access down farther. And the whole reason we're doing that is based on some input we had from people that live on the road. Mike Beverly was one of them. The very first time I met Mr. Beverly, he expressed some concern about where we were going to put the entrance, so we agreed to move it. And that's where we're asking the township for permission. Right now, We've got uh, a, a building that's sitting there right now, which is our construction office, but we'd like to convert that at some point in time into a classroom because one of the things that you do, it doesn't matter if you're a, a police officer or a soldier, whatever, when you come to a range to shoot, the very first thing you do is you go to a range safety briefing. 
each and every time. And that would be part of our process and that would take place in that building right there. And we also were talking about locating our indoor range there. The indoor range, just as a bit of an aside, is a purpose-built structure that we purchased from the Government of Canada and it was sitting up in the airport in Ottawa for three years, Steve? Five years, I'm sorry. And that's where all the people who are uh, border guards went and got their training on pistol. So it's a purpose-built structure to shoot inside in pistol lanes. It, it could not be safer at state-of-the-art and that would go there. Uh, now this is an important thing because the proposed outdoor ranges have changed and that it looks like a square but it's a slightly more of a rectangle and just so you understand the people that would be shooting would be where that dot is and the direction of fire would go out that way but here at the end of the range will be the um, berm which is a very high uh, mound of dirt that is the height and dimensions which are mandated by the chief firearms officer so we're going to do that but we're going to do something beyond that too and i touched on this earlier and i'm going to show you the picture in a little while we're also going to do the lead reclamation area and recycling area so if you shoot this is how it how it works i'm shooting at a target i miss the target if i miss the target it goes into the, re the lead reclamation and recycling area, which are basically giant baffles, and you're going to see the picture. And it goes back into there, and the lead round is contained in that, and then it's actually in a, in a, um, a container that's suitable to take away and recycle. If, for some reason, which I can't fathom, I miss the target, and I miss that big thing behind it, that recycling system, behind that, is a berm, which is a large pile of dirt, for lack of a better word, constructed in accordance with the chief firearms officer, so the round hits that. Three levels of safety, and if for some reason, which again, I, I just can't even imagine how that would happen, you get past all of that, you're out into here where there are no people and no houses. Uh, you'll see the green area, we are conscious of and have been in discussions about what the environmental protected area is up here. So nothing takes place in that area. And we've also got a 30, mil, a 30 meter um, cushion where we're not going to do anything 30 meters away from the environment, environmentally protected area as well, <laughs> just in case. The only other thing is we're going to ask for, to have the uh, potential in the future for another access road. There's actually a road that runs up to about that point, and we'd like to have the ability to access from either side in the future. That's it. That is the current plan. That is what we're going to be asking the township and the city to approve at this point in time. So as you can see, what we were thinking about doing and what we're asking you to do right now has changed drastically. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot something. Yep, and Steve, Steve did point that out. This, uh, this hockey stick looking thing right here is actually um, a, a berm. It's going to be a high dirt pile. And uh, the, the concept behind that is the, someone that's shooting is standing here. They're directing their firearm in that direction. So most of the noise goes that way. But because people live down here, by constructing that berm, the noise that's generated is going to be largely confined to the area north of the airport. So it's a, it's a noise mitigation measure that we can do that won't affect flight operations or anything else. It's going to cost Radical a little bit more money to have this berm constructed, but it's also something that we're trying to do as we work through these issues as we understand them. That's new. Okay. Now, there's another part of this, um, and this is not as easy to see, but this is basically this part of the airport right down here. See that? Oops, <laughs> never mind. But uh, Steve, can you go back one on this one, please? I just wanted to show folks, uh, right? Okay, so this diagram here is basically the end of the airport right down here, okay? So it, this zooms in on that. All right, Steve, you can jump forward. And all we're doing is showing you here what happens. So the existing runway, and taxiway and what we're looking at doing is we're looking at having constructed another way for aircraft to taxi off 
And then there's an area right here, it's like a pad, and then we're looking at constructing hangars down here to store aircraft. Because as you recall, I said earlier, a big part of this is a charter air service as well. So if you're going to have to do that, you need a place to keep your planes, you need a place to maintain your planes. And that's what that, that would be right there. So that's, that, that is, again, some additional information, a preliminary site plan with respect to the airside facilities that will be constructed as part of this entire project. All right, so um, what's changed uh, since uh, June uh, 15, uh, of 2015 and now? That's just kind of a summary of the points, all right? So as I already alluded to, we've agreed to move the entrance further west at neighbors, Mike Beverly's request. Uh, we got rid of the driving trail networks and designated wetlands, so no one's gonna be driving vehicles around up in here. The scope and the number of the proposed outdoor ranges reduced. Now you've got two potentially 50 meter ranges right there, side by side, direction of fire going off to where no one is. We moved the location of the outdoor ranges further north from their original and west, so that makes them safer and it mitigates sound for the folks that live down here. All right. The direction of fire, I already talked about that, has been changed based on the sound testing we conducted and the, and the feedback from the Chief Firearms Officer. We're now investing in a lead containment and recycling system, which will live there, that makes sure the bullets aren't going off into the uh, environmentally protected area. Drastic reduction in the number of training venues and the scope of overall development. You don't see all a bunch of things all over here too. And we've completed our preliminary airside design, the document I just showed you with the pictures of planes on it. That's what's happened between June and now, and that's one of the reasons why you haven't got a lot of information because it's been moving constantly, and it continues to move. So, what's next? All right, and I'm sure everyone's very interested in that as well. What we need to do is we need to finalize our lease agreements with the city of Brockville because if we can't lease the land, we can't go ahead with the development, and uh, I've been involved pretty much in that since day one. Uh, I drafted the leases, I drafted all three of them. They've already gone at least one time to the city solicitor who provided some feedback, asked for some changes, and we agreed to each and every change requested by the city solicitor. We didn't fight on one issue. Uh, we had then had another meeting with the folks at the city. We talked about some other issues. I drafted revisions based on our discussions, and those are now sitting with the city, and we're waiting to hear back from them. Based upon the work I've done to date with everybody from the city, I don't anticipate any issues or problems. And if they need us to change something, we'll change it. <coughs> it's, it's not a difficult uh, task from our perspective. So we have to also complete our existing site plan approval process. And the mayor alluded to the fact that it's been given a first and second reading and then they wanted to defer it until after they, we had an opportunity to do a few things, including speaking tonight. So we're hoping that'll go ahead. Uh, there are some ongoing discussions with Navigation and Transport Canada with respect to the airspace because it's an airport. And there are some meetings that are coming up that uh, Steve and some folks from Redical, along with folks from the city of Brockville, who run the airport and own the airport will be going to to make sure that Transport Canada and Nav Canada are willing to give their stamp of approval to what we're doing. If they can't or if they won't, this thing doesn't go anywhere. Again, it's just another level that we're working our way through. Uh, we're going to get the final range design approval from the Chief Firearms Officer, hopefully, and given that we moved the range and took their recommendations and we're overbuilding based on their requirements, I expect that should be fine. And then if, after we construct it, before we start shooting out there, they're going to come back and make sure we build it the way we promised that we would build it to them. <coughs> Again, no problem. It's part of the process we're working through. And the final issue is the master land use plan submission. This document right here has to be finalized. This is preliminary. We're going to continue working with the people from MMM in order to be able to finalize that to be able to go to both the city of Brockville and the township of Elizabethtown to tell them what it is we want to do. So that's it. That takes us to uh, what we've been doing, who we are, what we've been doing, why we've been doing it, how it's changed over time, and uh, what comes next. So before we open up to the Q&A session, 
I did want to address uh, a couple of points which I understand are, are of concern to you folks. And my understanding is based on the fact that Eric and I went to the public meeting, uh, which was held a few weeks ago by the citizens group, and I live around here half the time too, so I get my hair cut and tin cap. So I have a pretty good idea uh, you know, what people are talking about and what the concerns are. So let me just talk to a few things. Uh, safety, safety first, all right? So what are we going to do? We're not going to build the range to the chief financial officer's guidelines. We're going to exceed their guidelines in terms of safety. How are we going to do that? We're going to use berms. We're going to use the lead containment and recycling system, which is not a requirement, by the way. We could get approval from the chief fire, firearms officer absent that, and it's a very significant spend. And I don't know if, if you want to put a range on that, Steve, in terms of how to spend, but it's a lot of money. A lot of money, but we're doing it because we think it's important. Another thing is, uh, I know some people were concerned that the airport was going to have a big fence put around it. Not by us and not by the airport authority as far as we're con concerned. And there is no requirement to put a, a large fence around a range. But what we have suggested to the city of Brockville, and I think they're in agreement with once we finalize the leases, is Reticle is willing to, at its own expense, install a more sophisticated uh, detection system, which has a series of cameras on poles running along the property lines. For example, if this was the property line down there, there would be a camera on a pole which would be monitoring that property line. People can climb over fences and you'll never know. If people walk across that camera and that camera is monitored, then you can put out the appropriate response. No one said we had to do that but we think it's a good idea and we think it's going to help with safety, so that's what we're going to do if we can move forward with this. The people that are going to be out there are professionals. They're going to be police officers. They're going to be members of the armed forces. They're not going to be uh, just random people and they're not going to be people that have just hunted. I know there are people that hunt on this land who are accomplished hunters who have been hunting here for years. I'm not talking about them. But all of us that live in this community know that this time of year, you have to think twice before you go out in the bush during deer hunting season. That's not the people that we're going to have out there. We're going to have people whose job it is to be proficient with firearms. And the people that are going to be working there with them and training them are experts. Experts training experts. As I said, no firing towards tin cap, period. And I think we're, we're doing each and everything we can to mitigate the safety concerns. Noise, now that's another concern. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a few things. Here's that trap I've been telling you about. It's a front view. So as you can see, if you're standing back here and you're firing, the, the targets would be arrayed in front of this. You miss the target and the bullets actually go in here and they're collected at the back, and you can see just at the back there, there's actually a, a system where they go in canisters at the back where they can be picked up, taken, and recycled. That uh, is going to uh, be a large portion of what we're going to do. That captures bullets, that captures sound. You saw on the diagram the hockey stick that I almost missed, that berm. We're going to construct a large berm which is going to mitigate noise going back towards the, the airport and back towards where the folks live. Um, where we're going to re restrict access to the site and we've already moved uh, the ranges north and reduced the proposed number of ranges on site too. So any, uh, any regulation, any agency that says we have to meet a standard, we're going to continue to meet and exceed that. And we're, we're doing and we continue to do and we continue to work with Jeff on anything we can possibly do in order to mitigate the sound issues Keeping in mind, this is an airport. You know, planes and helicopters come and take off and land all the time. We can't eliminate all the sound. The final uh, issue I wanted to discuss was the concern about the loss of property values. And I know this is a concern. And I was at the meeting a few weeks ago where a lady stood up and said she was a real estate agent. And, and she said, I'm an, a real estate agent and I know it's common sense that anyone who owns a home around here is going to lose a value, it's going to lose value if this project's allowed to go ahead. 
And this project that she heard about was very, very different from what I've told you about tonight, but let's just assume that she came here and she said the same thing. Well, I think that common sense says otherwise. Now, anybody that's worried about sound is not going to buy a piece of property close to an airport because her helicopters and airplanes taking off and landing are always gonna generate a lot more noise, a lot louder, a lot more frequently than anything that we're gonna do. So, yeah, well. You're wrong, man. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have some patience, please. Okay. So, the, the, uh, we'll, we'll get into the sound issue, and look, it sounds like you guys have some concerns about sound, and you'll have an opportunity to ask us questions, and if we can answer them tonight, we will. If not, we'll, we'll address them. One thing maybe I didn't emphasize properly or enough in terms of the, the testing to date is all of the testing that has been done to date has been done under a worst case scenario. In other words, there were two factors that were at play that you may or may not have been aware of. One is the location from which people were shooting and the second is the nature of the weapons that they were shooting. So you had people that were shooting from locations that were close to the airport runway, closer to the south portion of the property. And the, the further you are south, the more the sound is traveling south to the, the, the properties that are located there. So we've moved north. The second issue is with respect to the nature of the weapons that were being used. We had the RCMP out there and they were shooting their sniper rifles. That's not the type of range that we're looking at constructing right now. So it's a much less caliber of a weapon. A less caliber of a weapon equals less noise, and we can provide you with some updated information with respect to that as well. So if you've heard something that you didn't like, we're not surprised, and that's why we're not gonna duplicate that again. The other issue is I took a look, because I said I've lived around here since 1999, and I had one of my friends who's a real estate agent take a look for me, and since January 1st of this year to the present date, within a 25 kilometer radius of the airport, 97 residential properties have been up for sale. So there is a problem that the mayor's alluded to. People are leaving and not coming here. We're looking at building a business. We're looking at increasing people coming from outside. We're looking at hiring local people on a full and a part-time basis. We're looking at injecting a lot of money into the local economy. I think that is going to potentially keep or improve property values. And that's my common sense perspective on it. I stand to be corrected, but that's how I feel about it, and that's how I, I see this unfolding. So, but now, I'm sure the point you've all been waiting for is the an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so uh, what we would like you to do is just go up to the um, microphone the mayors, I think, are going to uh, take the questions originally, and how it's going to work from the reticle perspective is if you have a question for reticle, you can ask me, and if we have the appropriate person here who's in a position to answer your question tonight, we will. If we can't tonight, we're going to get you that information, and I'll speak to Mr. Burroughs later to make sure he's the proper person to get that information out through. And if you have a question, obviously, for the, for the city or the township, they'll, uh, they'll field their own. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, just a couple of rules. I mean, I saw, I was at the uh, public meeting you had, uh, that Brant was running the other day, uh, and decorum was pretty important. You know, uh, the Mayor Pickard did speak up just a few minutes ago when you had some comments from the crowd, uh, but let's be respectable about it. You're, you're given an opportunity to ask some questions directly, and let's, let's, let's walk through the process. So, if you could, when you're starting to speak, if you could uh, just, just mention where you're directing the question because uh, we have some city staff here that are uh, associated with the airport. They may be able to answer it. It may be reticle. It may be somebody from the township. Okay? Sir? Yes, hello. I'd like to direct this question to the officials from reticle. Um, I'm curious to know about the duration and frequency of the firing. Is this going to be going on a seven-day-a-week basis? Um, how long during the day? Will there be restricted hours on when it will happen? If you could just address those hours and times and things. 
Uh, sure, I, I can do that. And I can tell you that uh, at this stage, the uh, idea is it's going to be uh, uh, Monday to Friday, typically. Uh, business hours, 9 to 5-ish. But I can tell you from personal experience that the people that come to shoot on ranges are never ready to start at 9 o'clock in the morning. So the reality is they probably start at 10. They probably finish around 4, 4.30. And, you know, occasionally there might be an opportunity or a requirement to do something in the evening. If we we're going to do something on the evening, I would be maybe once or twice a month, and it would be on prior notice to the folks that live in the area. And that, that's sir? kind of where we're at right now. So, Was there a follow-up? No, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mm. Ma'am? Hi, I live on Cavanaugh Road. Uh, we knew nothing about the test firing in July. Um, I called the Chief Pro Pro Provincial Firearms Officer. Apparently they knew nothing about it either. I'd like to know the date you actually contacted the CPFO. Again, that, that's me. And if you're, you're saying they didn't know anything about it, is it the shooting, ma'am, on the site? Yeah, okay. the, first, the first test firing in July. Yes, okay, uh, that, um, that would be correct uh, because the test firing, which was uh, the sound testing, was not something that uh, required the approval of the chief firearms officer because we weren't conducting what's called a raid. Okay, so he yep. actually wasn't involved at that point. That's correct, ma'am, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Sir? Okay, my name is Alex Scottsell. I live on uh, Airport Road, and I want to apologize. I'm the one who made the outburst here because I am very concerned about property values. You don't live here, and nobody on these boards or has anything to do with the decisions being made lives within a two-kilometer radius. I just want to confirm, what is the caliber of ammunition you're going to be shooting? At this point in time, on the ranges that are, are done, we're probably, the pistol range typically... Not the pistol range. I'm, I'm interested in the open air range. I'm sorry? The, yeah, that, the, that is, okay, the yeah, outdoor range. That is open air range, too. Uh, typically, 9 millimeter is what the police officers shoot out of their revolvers. The very most would be... What, 40, what is the largest caliber? Uh, That's what I'm asking. 45 caliber pistol and probably 5.56. Five, for a rifle application. What about 338s? No, that's not suitable okay. for the ranges that we're so going to construct. So you made some comments also that you've changed the direction of the range, which is good, Correct. but you're saying it's going in a northern direction. There are farm fields within a range that these bullets could make it if they were to ricochet. And I have some information here from uh, I'm, the I'm airport commission. Sorry. I'm sorry, sir, I, uh, um, I missed the last thing you said. Okay, so there are farm fields yes. north of the airport Yes. within a range we believe is, is close enough. Kids play, people farm. So okay. I, I, I just didn't like how you dismissed that uh, you've changed the direction so there's no worry. Okay. Um, but I have a question here for Mayor David Henderson now. Um, so according to the airport, I have to read this because this is uh, out of some minutes. Quote, it is the airport operator's position that a right-hand circuit on runway four in, is both necessary and practical solution to lessen the chance of a ricochet bullet striking an aircraft. And quote, Transport Canada and Nav Canada have determined that a defined airspace north of and northwest of the main runway would be restricted to an altitude of 5,000 feet when the rifle range is open to live firing. So these people are concerned about a ricochet going straight up 5,000 feet. That's so a pretty big caliber ammunition that could potentially make it 5,000 feet up and you guys aren't worried about 5,000 feet out horizontally? So the discussion that at the start we mentioned that there are ongoing discussions with Transport Canada and NAVCAN, and this is part of the discussion about the right-hand, left-hand turn coming out of or going into the runway to stay away from where the range is. And again, the regulatory bodies have guidelines. Uh, the 5,000 uh, uh, foot space are guidelines that they use for this conversation. Those are still ongoing and they will determine what is safe or allowable or not. In so a vertical direction, what about a horizontal direction? What guidelines do you have to base that on? What investigation have you done on that? That's the chief firearms office. Uh, would, would be the, pre the people and the regulatory agency. I'm sorry? Oh, okay, sorry. The chief firearms officer is, office is the uh, regulatory agency that needs to approve the range and the safety factors of the range in terms of berms and everything else. So we're not going to shoot any bullets unless or until they tell us that we can. And they will be the persons that, that say, based on their 
uh, rules and regulations, what safety area, what berm has to be there. And as I said, the, uh, the, the, the lead recycling is an overbuild. They don't require that, but we're going to do it anyway. So that exponentially increases the safety. Well, we're, we're very concerned about the horizontal distance that these can go so. Let me, let me take this one because I'm personally overseeing the range design. So going back to your 5,000 foot question, if you look at the Connaught Rifle Range, which is inside the city of Ottawa, immediately next to Canada, the ceiling for that rifle range is 1,900 feet above ground. We at Reticle have requested the ceiling to go to 5,000 feet so that we would have additional safety. So that's the difference between 1,900 feet, which is a range in the city of Ottawa that shoots 338 rounds. I've requested to go to 5,000 feet. Okay. I was, I was going to ask you if you requested that, so thank you for answering so, that question. Sir, perhaps one quick question, then we're going to move to the people behind you. Uh, and then I, I can move on. I, I think unless you have anything else to answer, uh, I'm, I'm done. I'm good. Nope. I think it's covered. There are ongoing discussions, and I think the question was pretty well answered there. But if you have another one, if you could let the next yes. guy go and we'll Absolutely. come back to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Earlier you said that you advised everybody that this testing was going to be done. I'm sorry, sir, you're wrong. I live on the Bruges. I was not told anything until I phoned the, uh, the township. I, I don't, if I said that, I misspoke. And I can tell you that... I am aware of and I stand by the comment that some of the testing was done intentionally without prior notice to the neighbors. So okay. if I said earlier tonight, I'm sorry, because I certainly didn't mean to say that because that's not the case. You're 100% right that now, you wouldn't have been told before some of that testing took place. If you look where I live and the airport, it's by the crow flies, it's about a mile. Okay. We see perhaps three, four aircraft at the most a day, except on those breakfast fly-in days. What are we looking at now? 40, 50, 100 a day? Uh, no, I wouldn't. Because I was so. told I was told by one of your representatives that you're going to be parachuting all different types of operations. I don't want that in my backyard. I didn't buy there. And you're saying that our property value has not dropped. My house is for sale right now. We haven't had a call in a month and a half. So, so sir, if you're prepared. If you're prepared to compensate us, that's one thing. But here's the second thing. If you're so keen, Mr. Mayor of Brockville, why don't you move this into the center of Brockville? No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being strange here. I'm being, I'm being straight with you. You're talking about X amount of jobs. Where were you when the people in the hospital lost their jobs? I didn't hear you crying out. No, sir. So let's, thank stay, you. let's stay focused on the questions here. Well, uh, that, the that, question, was your, that was your point, sir, that you made. It's jobs. It is. And uh, rather well, than me go into a speech about jobs, let's stay focused on the questions that we can ask right here. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, mine's on the property values, which he's already said is going to go up. Well, um, <laughs> I believe that when I see it. Um, if I, I bought the house 11 and a half years ago, right across from the end of the airport, if they disclosed to me, they disclosed to me that there was an airport there, and I went out and checked it out. Had they disclosed to me that there was this reticle thing there, I wouldn't have wasted the gas to come out and look at it. And the firing that they'd done there, the test firing, was just like a friggin' war zone. And you can say, well, we were t using different guns. Well, why did you bother testing if you were using different guns? You're going to use different guns now, and you tested with those. What, what's the sense? We're and you also said to the lady there that uh, the chief firearms officer doesn't require that for testing. I read the, the thing on the chief firearms officer, and you are supposed to have permission for any testing. That's what it says on these things. 
You and I have I a know, differing opinions. Care, sir. That, that's, no, I, I care completely. And actually, if I'm wrong on that, that's not good because I'm the lawyer and I'm, I'm the person that advised the client what they should and shouldn't do in terms of that testing. So I stand by what I said and I believe my opinion's correct, but I, I respect your, your right to disagree I, with me, I sir. I read so, on his thing there and it says that that has to be the way it is. Again, sir, you and I have differing, yeah. uh, differing opinions, and I respect that. The one question I can answer, and I, I hope this helps you, is we used the higher caliber weapons, so you, no one could ever say you came out and shot the little ones and then brought the big ones out later. You understand how that could be of concern. If we brought the small guns out and popped off a couple rounds, and then we set up the range and brought out the big ones, and all of a sudden it's a different noise, you'd be like, well, what are you guys doing? Why wouldn't you bring the big ones out from day one? That was the thought process. Uh, I, again, you, maybe you don't agree, but it makes sense to me. So. Okay, I'd also like to know whether um, the township will require that Radical hires an independent person to do the sound checks, not somebody that you've already hired and is on your payroll. Because that, you know, that's like the fox guarding the chicken coop. You know, like I, I don't know what the, the township's going to do, sir, but I, I can tell you that well, we this did... Well, for we, the, the okay, mayor. Okay, sir, but the, just to understand, what we did the testing so we could understand what the noise would be and how we could reduce the noise. There, were, there was no benchmark against which we were working. We were just simply seeing what we could do and how we could make it less. So that's why we did it ourselves. Is and that, is that so I can't the, answer the second part, okay? So. Is that why the test uh, meter didn't work? I was uh, there that day, sir, yeah. and I, get, I have a different opinion on that. And I was sir, standing right there the whole time. So. One other comment on the sound, just so you're aware, we didn't mention this earlier, is uh, the question had come up earlier about limitations on shooting regarding sound. So far in the discussions about a lease, there's a time limit that is similar to the noise bylaws in the city. That may or may not be acceptable to people in the area, but it was matching what the noise bylaws in the city for timing. So it's 11 p.m. at night and I think seven in the morning, uh, but clearly that might be changed as the process goes forward. So, sir. My name is Rod Charlton. I live on DeBruge Road. Um, initially, you mentioned uh, that this site would include training facilities for firefighters and first responders, but all of your presentation so far has reflected simply people who use firearms. So w are there future plans to expand this and include, uh, say, a fire pit or an upturned tank truck or that kind of thing? Uh, nothing specific to firefighting in the immediate plans, but when we're talking about first responder training, uh, that could all take place within uh, what we've been discussing. The, the focus, quite frankly, has been on the firearms portion because we think that's what people are concerned about. In the big picture business plan, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little and I may be speaking a little bit out of turn, but in the big picture business plan, there are six uh, ways to earn income uh, from the airport property for reticle. Uh, the firearms aspect of them is one of six. The firearms aspect is not the primary one, and the firearms aspect is something that when you're shooting guns, you can't be doing all of the other things. Therefore, you can't shoot guns all the time because you're preventing yourself from earning money doing other things like training firemen, like having people going to the data center, like people doing navigation exercises. There's a whole bunch of different things. So we talk a lot about the firearms piece because we think that's what people are concerned about, but the reality is in the overall picture, it's not a big chunk of the business. So there could be additional facilities added, uh, presume, if, if you, we assume that you get approval for this. There could be that, additional facilities added, which would include transportation of dangerous goods uh, training or, uh, or uh, first responder training or firefighting training? I don't know about the transportation of dangerous goods because that doesn't really fall into what we do, but the other things, yes. And we, there, when I showed you the diagram earlier, there was a kind of a blacked out area that, or brown area that said training area. So as we move forward, we would have to go back to the township and say, all right, what we want to do in this training area is... Is that uh, the brown triangle you're up Yeah, there? exactly. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And uh, yeah, kind of up in that area right there. And you also see the uh, potential development area in the yellow too, so kind of down by that red brick. There is a potential to put other things in there, but we can't do it all at once. 
but whatever we're going to do, we understand completely that we have to go back to the township and go through a, an additional process to make that happen. And we will, of course, do so. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir? Uh, my name's Anthony DeVoe. I live on the corner of Bronze and Airport Road. And my question is... Sir, could you uh, pull the mic down? Sorry, Otherwise, that. they won't hear you when they record this. It's actually directed to you guys anyways. What is the projected congestion or traffic patterns directly on Airport Road going to be? I'm going to look to our staff. Connell, you guys have information on that? Hasn't been a discussion that we've had because uh, it's one of those issues that would be nice to have that problem at some point in some ways. I, um, hasn't been a discussion. I moved from Ottawa to get away from traffic. Yeah. Well, and let's so this, be is, this is why it's become a problem for me. There's kids that live on these streets, and if the traffic gets more than what I expect, then it becomes a danger for our, for our community, and the road isn't built for it. Yeah, I answer from the city's perspective so far, Steve, you would have to comment, but uh, none of the conversation has implied that there would be enough activity to warrant a problem with traffic. So now you keep in done, mind so that you haven't done any type of protection. not at this point. And now whether the township will require more on that, but uh, keep in mind as well, it is a commercially zoned property, and we are actively trying to lease out property there. And if there were other businesses, we would actively pursue them to have more traffic there. So that similar question will come up regardless of what type of operation there, because the ultimate goal as a property owner there is that it be active. It's an airport that is commercially zoned for jet aircraft and helicopters. So. If I can, um, to answer your question, no, I'm not aware of any traffic uh, studies that have been done on the airport road. Can it be done? Yes. Should it be done? Um, right now, the traffic uh, from, and this is anecdotal, and it's my own personal experience, having traveled that road for over 50 years, that uh, the traffic uh, has not increased dramatically until such time as they built the, the subdivision, of course, and that increased your traffic flow. There has not been a lot of increased traffic flow going down that road specifically to the airport. I think that... Uh, uh, if that is a concern, uh, certainly uh, a traffic study can be done. Uh, it's, it's quite easy to do, and as a municipality, we can do it through our public works department. So that can be done, yes. And I would uh, respectfully suggest that if it's going to be done, and I'll speak to, to our staff, that if it's going to be done, it should be done now, and um, probably uh, in, the, uh, in the spring as well, and in the summer. So you can get three, di three different... Uh, uh, times of the year and then you do an average of oh, traffic. Also, how, how, with regards to reticle, are they going to be transported primarily by plane or by vehicle? Uh, I think that's kind of guesswork at this point in time. I, I would expect that a lot of people that are coming there would be coming by vehicle, police forces, uh, they come in buses, things like that. There will certainly be people flying in from time to time, but it's, it's kind of speculation at this. I'm sorry, but at this stage, it's, it's really hard to say. Well, that's why I'm asking this question yep. with regards uh, to... I'll, I'll take a, a run at that, Bryce. So I want to deal with the first question about traffic. So again, having been doing this for over 20 years and routinely moved hundreds of soldiers around Ontario, routinely done, have done this, I would go back to when the RCMP came out to visit us four times over this summer. The RCMP had, on average, eight officers with them for the four visits. They came in two vehicles. When you look at two or one, because we're only pursuing one range right now, quite honestly, one 50-meter range, the maximum number of officers on that 50-meter range is probably 20. So if we just divide 20 by four, we're looking at five vehicles. So there's not going to be a significant amount of traffic coming to this, uh, this location in terms of air, um, when you look at our, our follow-on picture here, we've got, we're showing three. Um, those are not Hercules aircraft, by the way. They're a 295 her, uh, aircraft. 
the intention with the air charter service would be to base out of here and go elsewhere okay. so planes are based here pilots and crew are based here maintainers are based here those planes fuel up here and then go else to where they go where they need to go so an, an earlier gentleman talked about parachuting this parachuting issue keeps coming up the parachuting activity might happen might happen once a quarter most likely once a year at best because there's other places to parachute so i just want to i want to deal with those two air and, and vehicular traffic uh, questions Okay, Alex Gonsal here again from Airport Road. I just want to uh, elaborate a little bit more on what the last gentleman asked. So uh, given that this could be a 50 to $100 million project, that's obviously going to involve a lot of heavy equipment and construction traffic in the beginning. And then to make this viable, there's still going to be a lot of traffic in the future. Airport Road doesn't see a lot of traffic right now. I'm a father of two kids, a two-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son, okay? So to have this traffic there does concern me. This part of the question is directed at uh, Mayor Jim Pickard. Um, what is the Township of Elizabethtown Kitley going to do or willing to do to make Airport Road and the Tin Cap area safer when it comes to this traffic? Uh, questions like, are you going to repave the road? Are you going to widen the road? Are you going to put sidewalks? Are you going to put lighting? Because right now, it's dark and it's getting darker. So if there's any training going on in the winter time, it doesn't even matter what time of year, it doesn't matter. There's gonna be traffic. It could be later at night. Are you guys willing to do that? And where's that money gonna come from? Because I don't wanna pay for it. So I already pay enough taxes. It's your job to keep us safe. There's only one taxpayer as we know. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not prepared to, and I, yeah, right with you, honestly, I'm not prepared to answer that question right now because I don't know what the traffic flow is going to be. And I think as a municipality, to be responsible, then we would react to an issue. Why would we go and spend a lot of money on something that may or may not happen? We don't know. Will we react positively if there becomes an issue? Absolutely. Okay, that's on the record. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and to be fair to the question as it was answered just previous to that, the answer was, if required, a traffic analysis. And then we heard from Steve Day who said, here is the facility that is contemplated to be built now, and here is a, a rough approximation of the traffic associated with that facility. But it's nowhere near the kind of congestion you just talked about. So let's be fair to the questions. Part of that was answered, okay? Now, how can you make that projection when this is the first time this, anything like this has ever been done? Well, part of that, that estimate, as we just heard, is that there is a facility. They've got a business plan with a number, an estimate of how many could use a facility at a certain time. That's a, the starting point of a traffic analysis. Right and there. so, Steve, you think that 20, 20 people on site per day shooting off a few bullets is going to pay for this 50 to 100 million dollar project? There's going to be more traffic than 20 per day to pay for this. And, and as we heard just before that, that the range will be a small factor of the entire business plan. So let's be fair to the question. So then wouldn't traffic increase if the range is just a small aspect of it? If we're, if we're looking at five other aspects to this project, that could bring in a lot more traffic too. And, and that's why my first response was that we can do a traffic study now, take a look at what the traffic flows are, and let's see what the traffic flows are if this project goes through, and it's not a given that it will, but if it occurs, then let's take a look and see what the impact is upon the road. Because certainly we have to look at the road, the road design, and so on. Widening a road is going to speed up the traffic, but it's not going to address, I think, your concerns. Uh, there's other mitigating factors that can be used if they are necessary. But let's get a road count now. We have, um, I'm not going to say we have one that's current. I don't think we do. But let's try to get a more current based upon the concerns. And then going forward, let's see if, in fact, there is a huge traffic increase. And we can do another uh, road count and do a comparison analysis. Okay, and I do agree that we should do that count, but again, you're just going to compare it to projected numbers. Where are these numbers going to come from? Spit out of a computer program? Nobody knows. 
So you can't wait until after the fact to do something about this. You have to be proactive, not reactive. Sir, your point's made. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Len Reich. I live on the airport, 4651 Airport Road. Uh, what I see tonight is a, a totally different perspective of what I seen back in, uh, in June, I guess, when we had our first little meeting at the airport. Uh, that project there, the way it was kind of described to me at that time, it had a lot more aspects in it than what we're seeing today. So the picture and my questions now have, I have to go back to the drawing board and make up new questions. Uh, one would be if I was in the uh, Elizabethtown Kitley Council, I would say, I'm looking at this. Is this the ultimate plan from when we started? And on that first meeting, I heard they say that this was a 15 year plan. It had lots of neat stuff in it. It had firing ranges with 338 calibers. It had a driving track. It had a, a mock village that you could blow up. It had parachute jumping. That's a far cry from the plan of what we see today. What scares me and what makes me nervous is if I was a council member having to make a decision on this project, is this the foot in the door? Is this the tip of the iceberg? Where's this going? This is, we've been told this is a multi-million dollar project. One little shooting range with 22 caliber rifles or whatever, they are, nine millimeters, 45, 5.6 or 5.56, I don't know nothing about guns. That's a far cry from what we heard at the beginning. I don't understand where this is going. I'd be asking a big question of where this is going. Now, I know you can't answer that, but that's just a, a perception that I want to put out there. And truly, to council members, I would have to ask the same thing. What is the ultimate plan? Because we have to make a decision on the ultimate plan. And it's a far cry, I believe, than what we see tonight. Sir? Now, having, having said that, I know you want to interrupt me, but that's uh, okay. I'm just hoping for a question, that's all. <laughs> okay, you're hoping for a question. Well, I've got one. We initially thought it was a military-style operation. That's changed tonight. We heard differently. But still, you're going to be shooting off a lot of bullets, guns. How many a day, would you think? How many shots a day? Three. How many times a week? So, uh, we, like I said, as part of our market study, uh, actually, Len, do you want to finish with your questions and I'll take them okay. one at a time? Because if it's a numerous amount of shots, more than just your little local gun club that does. If it's a numerous amount of shots, yes, we're going to have an intensity of a noise problem. You got your burns now, you got your things, you're not shooting the loud uh, guns anymore, you're not doing things like that. So if that's the case, we put forth to council, we asked them to look at a noise bylaw that was targeted specifically for shooting ranges. We gave them two specific examples that they could work with and look at. It sounds like now with your new plan, you'd have no objection of our council members putting forth a noise bylaw. There are some pretty impressive numbers in those two examples, and we've asked council to have a look at that. My question to you would be, are you in objection to a noise bylaw? The, the and I guess I'm directing that to all three is. I can speak to it from Reticle's perspective as a lawyer. Uh, in the abstract, it's impossible to answer. And I know very well the two examples that you put forth to council with respect to other jurisdictions that impose noise bylaws. But the situations there and the situations here are very, very different. So my professional opinion is those wouldn't apply locally. But having said all that, you know, the, it's up to local government well, to do what they want to do. And it's true, we but we're talking about do. noise. Well, noise is applicable that. 
to no matter where you are. Well, it doesn't matter what the nature of the business is. It's the it nature of the does. noise, and therefore, it's a bylaw. Well, listen, sir, again, I respect your opinion, and I, I understand that your opinion is not the same as mine, and I get paid a good amount of money to render legal opinions and provide them to my client, and I stand by my opinion, and, you know, if, if, if you prove me wrong, I'll accept that too, but I don't it, think it's so. It's not a question, sir, of proving you right or wrong. The question that I'm trying to get answered here, and I don't believe you're answering my question, is would you be opposed to a noise bylaw? It it's got to do with noise. <laughs> it depends what it says. You know, that, that's the answer. Well, I don't know. How can you, I say You've that? looked at two examples. You just said you looked sir, at two examples. Sir, I'm going to ask you to uh, uh, leave. Get another question. <laughs> or I mean, the gentleman's answered the question. You don't like the answer. No, that's no, a little uh, different. no, no. It's not that I don't like the answer. I don't think he's answered my question. No, he did. He said he would not recommend it. It would not be applicable in his opinion. Okay, maybe that I misunderstood was what him. he said. Yeah. So he did answer it. So please, another question, or allow the gentleman behind you. Very good. I'll get Thank my you. turn at the end. <laughs> okay. My name is Ray Lindsman. I live on the uh, Kilkenny Road. The, um, uh, I'll try and make this. I've got actually two different types of questions. One is to, uh, at this point, I'd address it to Mayor Pickard. The, uh, the township has a bylaw, and I'm not sure whether this is the up-to-date one. It was uh, bylaw 05-04, being a bylaw to prohibit the discharge of guns or other firearms in certain areas. I would suggest that because of the nature of this, you should revisit that bylaw and decide whether there should be restrictions on the calibers and things so that we know what the playing field is at this time. And then if things change down the road, then there would have to be a process to go through in changing to using higher power rifles or whatever. So if you would take note of that. Point noted. Okay. The other um, observation, um, in my career I had exposure to acoustics measurements and, and different things and I had occasion to go up to some of the, uh, the labs at Nortel in Ottawa and visit their sound rooms and such. I'd like to suggest that there's far more efficient ways of dealing with the sound issues than earth berms. It would be putting a, a barrier around where the firearms are being discharged. There's type of acoustic type material that would absorb a lot more sound. I would seriously like to see uh, a commitment from the company to uh, investigate those type of options because it sounds like the sound noise aspect is a very serious consideration for most of the folks here this evening. And uh, it may end up being no difference in price than putting a huge earth burn in there. Or maybe it complements it and, and such. So um, I guess the question to Reticle is, uh, were other um, sound baffling systems discussed or considered? That's, that's an ongoing investigation and I, I, I introduced you earlier to the gentleman who has a number of degrees who we've retained to assist us with that. <laughs> and uh, it, having said that, we're open to suggestion. We're certainly not slamming the door on anything. And if we're spending money to build berms, we can spend money on more efficient sound reduction technology 100%, yes. Yeah. So. I'll, I'll just pile on to that, Bryce, because uh, Bryce wasn't privy to this conversation earlier today with Matt up from uh, Provo, Utah. We are absolutely going to do some other leading edge uh, sound attenuation. So we can't show everything on a, on a site sketch. The berm is just one physical feature that will uh, attenuate some of the sound. But as we work, look at building the range, we are absolutely going to put whatever we need to put there to try and manage that sound as best we can. But I'm going to tell you right now on the record, you are still going to be able to hear some noise. It is impossible to get rid of everything. So we will do everything we can, clearly with the CFO's support, with the city's support and the township support. But we, I, I will commit to you today that we will do everything we can to manage that sound but you are going to hear something. And it may be at 40 decibels, it may be at 50 decibels, it may be at 60. I don't know, but we will investigate every option and we spend a bit of time with, with Matt this morning or this afternoon talking about options. Right, I, I agree. You're not gonna reduce the, uh, the level of the noise, but you're gonna be able to reduce the distance that it's gonna carry and, and then um, 
area that it affects. The other suggest last point I'd like to make is that uh, as far as discharging the firearms, I would suggest if this isn't already a requirement, that it be uh, at an elevated area to the target, so effectively you're shooting down rather than level, which might reduce your uh, concerns about projectiles going past. One question I do have, though, because I thought I heard two different numbers here. Is what, what is the distance of the ranges, both the indoor and the outdoor? You had 50 meters up there earlier? Yeah, the outdoor range is, sir, are 50 meters, and the indoor range is 25. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. And by the way, yes to your, uh, your other point about uh, shooting downwards, that's kind of standard, so just so you know. Mr. Burroughs? Yeah, my name is uh, Brant Burrow. Bryce will recognize me, a couple of the other players as well. I just want to explain for uh, other people in the audience, I don't live near this facility. I won't be directly affected by it. My involvement uh, is simply at, at the request of some people who do live in the area who reached out uh, because they know that I attend council meetings on a regular basis. And they just asked me, you know, can you help us understand the, the process and, and that type of thing. Um, Bryce will remember, uh, as will you, uh, Dave, from the... Um, from the presentation, one of the themes of the residents' meeting was that people teach you how to treat them. So I'm, I'm sure it should be no surprise to, to Reticle that, that based on, on Steve's initial presentation in August that highlighted the six points uh, and the, the 50 to $100 million build and, and so on, if, if the public got a, a, a skewed perception of what was going in there, uh, I'm not sure that the responsibility for that rests with the public. So that, that's just a, an opening comment. Um, the, the question I want to get to is a, is a question with a suggestion. The, the question is, would you consider? And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is I'm a firm believer it's one thing to bring up concerns and to make complaints, but to be productive in the process, okay, fine, you've identified a concern, now what's your suggestion to address it? So I wanted to come here with some kind of, of an alternative that will still hit on a number of the points that are trying to be uh, achieved. So. Mm. Would, would the panel give me one minute and indulge me in, in that? Pretty flexible. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so, so touching on your regional comment, uh, uh, Mayor, if we're all in this together, would, would Reticle consider looking at this plan slightly differently? And that is, for instance, uh, the challenge for the indoor range would be uh, three-phase power and access to natural gas. Well, the Elizabethtown Industrial Park has those things available and has the appropriate zoning for instructional facility. That may be an, al an alternative. Given the scale of the outdoor range that we see right now, you could consider working with the Brockville Fish and Game uh, Club. They already work with other agencies such as Ministry of Natural Resources who make use of their facilities for, uh, for various exercises. Um, the driving course may be better located near the existing racetrack where you know, those types of noises and, and so on are already dealt with by the, the, uh, the residents. The paratrooping, if it's going to take place, obviously that's an airport-related activity. Um, the mock villages, if they're going to take place, uh, they may be located at the end of, of Coons Road. There's a large area that's zoned appropriately for an instructional facility. Uh, and, and my understanding, I may be wrong on this, my understanding is the former Tin Cat Public School, I believe it's currently Campus Kids, may be becoming available. So if you're looking for an administrative location, you may be able to base your offices there. I'd like to pick up on, on something that, that Bryce said uh, earlier, and that is when the outdoor range is working, other activities can't be taking place at the school. By distributing this around so that it probably would be better accepted than concentrating it all in one place, you would actually be able to carry on training activities in parallel, which as I understand it is not something that, that this will accomplish. So for what it's worth, I put that out there as a totally different alternative that is a regional-based approach. We are still all in this together. It would still bring the jobs to the area. So it, I think it does tick a lot of the boxes. Um, it's an outside the box type of concept compared to what you presented, but that's what we had come up with at, at a recent meeting of the, of the residents as well. How can we maybe accomplish most of this uh, with something that everybody can live with? So for what it's worth, there it is. Yeah, so, so again, I'll, I'll tackle that one. So I, I want to come back to an earlier comment about the 50 to 100 million build on this because that is correct. That was what we were looking at before we understood the impacts of the environmental problem. Sure. So when you look at that design, a blue sky approach, a concept approach, and we told everybody this is a concept over 15, because I want to go back to Len's point earlier. This is a concept over 15 years until we do our studies. 
We went through that process, understood that we couldn't fit all of this stuff here, notwithstanding some of the concerned citizens, so we dialed that back, and we have actually, as a matter of fact, engaged the township and some other local industry in looking at alternative solutions. But what, what I need to, uh, I guess what I want to drill home here, just because this may not all be on the airport, doesn't mean it's not necessarily options for the region or for other regions. So we are actively engaged in talking with other municipalities about things I might be able to move from here and still be proximate. So, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I think my name is... Um, just before you go ahead, Bruce and Brant, uh, concurrent with that. So just keep in mind there are clearly some aspects that have to stay on an airport, right? There's airport-related aspects. The firing range, while not being directly related, does require space. So that would pose a bigger challenge. But most of the other aspects, you know, have requirements for buildings, sites, infrastructure as you talk. So, yeah. Bruce? Well, and I want to add to that comment you just made. One of our concerns with this whole process is that all along, we've heard that there's 400 and some acres of land here at the airport. But in actuality, we figured there's probably about 150 that's actually usable by rectal. And so one of our concerns is that, you know, we don't see us having enough land to be able to do what you say you want to do here. So that's why Brant has proposed some other options to you. Because, I mean, you got 400 acres, but you got 150 acres of swamp. You got another 150 acres that's currently being used by the airport for hangars and in runways. So that leaves you with about 150 acres. That's not a lot of land to do what you want to do. So we have concerns around that. And that's why we've made some other proposals that Brent just spoke about. Okay, so Steve, hear that. Okay. Do you have um, a question, Bruce? Yep, question is for the township, for Mayor Picker. Are you concerned about the existing and potential future damage to the environmental protected areas in the airport with all this stuff that's going on with all the bulldozing that's been done um, with all these plans um, I know you've got a pretty green line there planet but are you are, are painted out but are you concerned as a township that they're going to do damage to these wetlands because as a neighborhood as a community we certainly are I think uh we all have concerns around uh, environmental protection uh, of, uh, of where we live. And in the airport, we have actually, uh, within the uh, confines or boundaries of the airport, we, there are designated, uh, and just outside, I should say, de designated environmental protection areas. The airport has had uh, roads or trails for many, many years. I think, Bruce, you know, because you, you, you work here or hunt on that, on that property. So you've walked those trails. And if I were, what I was seeing on the diagram is most of those trails are outside the environmental protection agency, or, or environmental protection zoning. And I think Steve addressed it as well, uh, that uh, uh, they are, and I'll use his words, dialed back some of their proposals because they realized just what you were saying, because of the, really the number of uh, uh, acres or hectares that are available uh, for development are very limited because of the environmental protection zone. Uh, so, sir, do we have a concern? Sure. And I think that's why, and as I stated at the, uh, at the beginning or at the outset of this meeting, and I've stated at council, that we will not approve anything until we have a site plan. Certainly that is a consideration in that site plan development is what is the impact upon the environment. Absolutely. Well, and just to uh, just add... Bruce, I Bruce, just, sec, just to add to that, you, you brought that concern to me early on in the process. Uh, and I went to the site and actually drove the trail and uh, drove the entire trail that they'd bulldozed, checked out what they had done, the, what they had set up as targets, uh, actually got out and looked around and checked it, everything that they had done. And everything that I saw was within the right boundaries. And again, we, as a landowner, demand that they go by all the reg regulatory steps. And that means Ministry of Environment, CRCA, all of it. They have to on our land. I so. hear what you're saying, but you don't have all the information. 
Okay. The trail that you're talking about, there was one trail that, that went on the left-hand side all the way into the swamp. All the other trails that were bulldozed to the north, sorry, to the east, were non-existent before. Yeah, all those new roads are all new. They were never there before. So everything from that red dot to the east, to the right, all that, where that little lake line is where they bulldozed, there were no trails there before. So that's all been newly bulldozed. That is according to the maps we've got in the EP protected area. So you don't have all the information, is what I'm telling you, Dave, okay? Because okay. we've got the information to show different. Okay. They are we'll bulldozing in the EP area. We'll continue to work okay. with the right regulatory bodies okay. and check it. And Steve knows that too. Okay. Steve. Yeah, j just to respond to that, and um, again, what we are doing in concert with the city, the airport manager, was reopening existing trails. So if by chance we made a mistake, then I own that mistake, but I will guarantee everybody in this room, we did not go in the EP, and quite frankly, if we happen to bulldoze a farmer's field that was fallow, oh well, it used to be a farmer's field. So Bruce, I don't have a lot of sympathy for, with your point, we were not in the EP zone. We were opening existing trails, and if we made a mistake, we made a mistake in a fallow farmer's field. That shows good character. I, I, and I, I, think, I think what I'd like to, just to make a comment, and, and this has to do, and, and Mayor Henderson touched on it. Uh, this is a, a unique project from the perspective of the two municipalities being involved, Township for Zoning, and of course, the, the city of Brockville as the landlord. And this is where Brockville and Elizabethtown Kitley uh, are trying to work together uh, to address concerns, legitimate concerns, uh, from the landowners in the area, uh, and also to address uh, the requests that have been made, uh, particularly the city be as, as the landlord, to, to lease property. And we're trying to work together on this. And that's unique in itself. Um, and Dave and I have a, I, d I don't want to go down that road, but Dave and I have a, a pretty good working relationship. Uh, and uh, there are many things to come forward uh, in uh, positive in that relationship. So I think that are we aware of, of and, and to address specifically, Bruce, your, your comment around environmental issues, uh, certainly we're, we're aware, uh, want to address that. We don't want to turn our back on that. That would not be good stewardship. It would not be good governance. Uh, so certainly we want to look at it. If, if something has occurred, then I think it has to be looked at. But you can't undo what may be done. And I do know, and again, from, from my experience at the airport, because I've been hanging around that airport since the 60s, uh, not so much now as I got older and just quit flying, but uh, uh, there were a lot of, 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 I know a lot of uh, trails back through there, which they did way back in the 60s and the 70s, and they were cleaning, cleaning out the uh, uh, beaver dams, et cetera, in the water, uh, at flooded areas. So anyway, uh, just to let you know, uh, we are not, as a municipality, and I, I'm not going to speak for Brock, but I think I'm comfortable in saying this, we are not turning our back on any environmental or potential environmental issues if we are aware of them. I would reiterate that because obviously we have procedures and policies and concerns. We are concerned about the same environmental issues. So it does not make sense for us to ignore any of them and take a step that would cost us down the road. Municipalities tend to be somewhat cautious that way. Um, Ma'am? Um, my question is concerning the future secondary access on the map. Um, I do believe that is Kavanaugh Road, which is where I live, and I'm just wondering um, who would be paying for that road to be put in? Would that be taxpayers paying for that? And what kind of traffic would be expected coming down that road? Yes, it is, and I have a small child, and I, I bought it because I was planning a family and have want my kid to be able to play without traffic and so the future access road on the airport property 
as the landlord, I'm going out a little bit of limb here, but we would expect the reticle to put it in if they want it. So we expect them to pay for it. <laughs> so reticle's Agreed, gonna, yes, yeah. Steve's mm -hmm. gonna look at me and go, what do you mean? But, yeah. uh, right. but we wouldn't do it otherwise. Right. As far as the connection to the road and what would happen on that road, I, I mean, I, there must be a process in place. What I'll just say at this point is that uh, the the uh, the end of Cavanaugh Road, you know where that is. The extension heading out. I, I live at the very end of that. And 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 the extension heading west uh, towards the Wood Road is a non-open road allowance uh, in the municipality. So, um, and it's remaining a non-open road allowance at this point in time. Uh, going forward, uh, we'd ha we have we again municipalities react to requests, uh, but we don't traditionally. Uh, open up on on uh, on open road allowances and and, uh, and and put a new road through. We don't do that. So if Histor if, historically if speaking, radical puts a road in, and I guess the question is directed now at them. Um, what kind of traffic do you expect to be bringing down that road? If the township doesn't open the unopened road allowance, we're not putting a road in up there. Maybe, okay, well, maybe that wasn't it, clear. If it did, would you think that would be a main entry? Or no, 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 no. That would be. The, you know, based on my understanding of the current plan and how things develop, that would be a very occasional use at best. And, you know, if a vehicle got stuck on the other road or something like that, or periodically, but I wouldn't even think it would be daily. No, not even daily. So, not even one vehicle a day, man. Okay. Okay. Ma'am? Hi. Just for the record, I just want to say that I'm born into a military family, and both my parents were declarated officers in the Air Force and both are now bur buried in the National Military Cemetery in Ottawa. So I'm very, I'm very proud of both my parents for all their accomplishments and the things them and their fellow servicemen have done and dedicated to our country. I do have a question though. Um, you had said 11 p.m., probably shooting until once a month at 11 p.m. Um, that's dark, no matter what time of year that is. Are you gonna be shooting in the dark? Uh, if there was anybody that was shooting after dark, it would be people that were using special night vision devices to assist them with their shooting, and that's why it's a very, very specific thing. So this is very hypothetical, but it's possible because police officers and military personnel do sometimes have to shoot in the dark, but they have special sites to do that, and it's a very, very, very controlled environment. And it would be very rare, too. It's not something that happens all the time. Okay. Um, you've made some lot of um, burnums and that for the southern neighbors, but for those of us on the north, you've moved everything north, and so now it's going to be noisier for us northern folk. We have uh, farms, we have goats, sheep, chickens, um, there's at least half a dozen farms all surrounding the airport, and we have little kids, and just wondering what, are, what can you do to help us with the noise? Um, whatever we can and uh, that's an ongoing uh, thing that we're looking at again I, I mentioned we, we've got Jeff hired as an employee full-time to address that and uh, I'm not a sound guy I you know I've, I've had a few things explained to me and quite it, it goes a little bit over my head but we're very very aware very aware of that and as Steve mentioned earlier we're looking at doing things that bring technology to bear we're gonna build berms we're gonna do a lot and if, as we move forward, feedback from you folks seems reasonable to me, given the fact that there has been a shift more to the west and the north. But we're aware of that. No one's pointing things right in your direction. We know you folks are out there, and we're going to try to work with you. Well, and farm animals are very susceptible to noises. Understood, ma'am, yes. So, and that's their livelihood. Yep, um, I, I understand. If I can have one more question. I think I missed something. So you said you had a six-part business plan. Uh, All yeah. I got out of it for tonight was the firing ranges. What other okay. pieces are the business Could, plan? Are you okay with this? Yeah, okay. this is like a little bit of like confidential business information. But so there's the training we, we talked about of first responders, police and service members. A small portion of that involves shooting. Uh, the other part is the, the air charter, which is going to improve the airport in terms of traffic and profitability because we're going to buy the fuel there too. Uh, reticle office operations center, also with a data center because there's a cyber component to what we do as well. Uh, there is um, an idea of what Steve describes as an innovation center where if people are having trade shows, they have the ability to bring out and something everybody can relate to a tractor and show a tractor how it moves and everything like that. So something along those lines, an innovation center to support trade shows. Uh, we're also going to be having 
what is going to be called the Loyalist Shooting Club, which is going to be a not-for-profit uh, shooting club that members of the community will have an opportunity to join and uh, be able to come out and utilize some of the facilities as well. Uh, that drives profit back into uh, the company, which then reinvested in the facilities and also a museum. So those are the six things right now, the six kind of pieces that all kind of make up the radical vision for this area. Okay, sir? Yes, uh, I'm Bob Fisher. I live to the north of the uh, airport. And uh, you've told us tonight where you're not shooting anymore at the subdevelopment in Tin, Ta tin Cap, um, but you haven't told us what direction you are shooting in. There's the industrial park, there's the quarry, and there are my work fields where I drive horses, uh, neighbors ride horses, and uh, it's fairly close to, it would be within the range of your high-powered rifles. Well, sir, maybe that is the, the place where people would be standing. That would be the direction of fire, that mm -hmm. way out into there, and I said earlier there was a better map we could look at, but to get past that, you would have to miss the target, you would have to miss the recycling system, which you, we showed you a picture of, you would have to miss the berm. There, so there is an area out there, but it, it's, uh, I don't think it gets anywhere near you, where you could possibly be, and as I said, the high-powered rifle, the three oh eights that were done earlier, that's not an application that would be dealt with right there. It's not built for that. What is the range of the 5.56? Five, five, is that, you said, the most um, powerful rifle? I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know that off the top of my head, but it's probably less than half of the 308 in terms of a range band. Yeah, I'll, I'll, again, I'll provide some additional commentary, Bob, because what, uh, so after we met in, I think it was March or April when we sat down with you and Diane, yeah. we've reoriented that range, so now the safety template does not even touch your property. Okay. This is that range is oriented out towards the Tackaberry Quarry in discussions with Tackaberry Quarry. So okay. the safety template does not even touch your property right now. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Burroughs. Yeah, this will be a, a simple question, especially con uh, compared to the first one. And this is born out of, out of ongoing discussions that, that I've had with either small groups of residents or, or the big meetings and, and so on, and that is can you zero in as specifically as possible on why here? Why specifically here? And that's not born out of, we, you know, I personally don't want that to be interpreted that I personally want to drive this completely out of the area and lose the 40 jobs. I know, I know Brockville has a vested interest to do this. That's a pretty obvious answer for why here from, from your perspective, so I understand that. But I guess primarily directed to reticle, for the purposes of, of satisfying the curiosity of a lot of people, even though nobody has yet asked this, can you zero in as specifically as possible on why here? What is so attractive about this one compared to your other options? Yeah, that's a, again, that's very, very uh, simple for us to answer. So we've done the study for surrounding communities. When you look at where Brockville and Elizabethtown at least sits strategically between Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto, with an airport that's underutilized along the 401 corridor, along the St. Lawrence Seaway, with an industrial base, with skilled workforce, and with land and space, it is a, it's a no-brainer. Within three hours of here, we have over 40,000 national security actors who require training. And I, for one, am tired of seeing the Moncton shootings, the Mayor Thorpe shootings, um, My colleagues, excuse me, who cannot get world-class training in this country. It drives me crazy to see Canadian taxpayer money spent in the United States, who is a close ally, when those Canadian police officers, first responders, need that training now. They need it here, they need it in this country. So when you look at where Brockville sits, it is strategically located on the major transportation corridor of, the, of Canada. When you look at eight to 10 million people within four to five hours of here, it is a no-brainer. So when we look at what we're trying to do, who we're trying to help, and I'm committed to helping those people, I apologize if it happens to inconvenience a few folks, but we're gonna do everything we can to enable those to protect us.
Okay, well, th thank you very much for putting that in un understandable terms because that's a question I haven't been able to, to answer for anybody and it's been asked of me many, many times. So thank you on behalf of those that, that really wanted to ask it for providing that answer. Thanks. Question? Hi, my name's Jeff Robinson. I live on Susan Drive and obviously this conversation just took a turn for the emotional. Um, I don't think any of us is going to argue against stopping the Moncton shooting and that kind of stuff, so I can appreciate where you're coming from. Except, however, you did kind of forget to mention, and forgive me, I'm going to sound kind of rude here, you're profiting off of this. So I understand your emotional you know, connections, and I get that, um, but at the same time you're saying, I'm sick of seeing Canadian tax dollars go south, I want them here in my pocket. Um, okay, so sir, question. I'm sounding, I apologize, it's gotten emotional. Let's, question. Be, let's be very fair about this. This is a business proposition. We yes, want a business proposition. Yes, yes. And so, so your the question? argument from emotion it's sometimes, uh, let's argue on a business case. Fair enough, case let's go to the question. So, business case. Uh, back to the uh, environmental stuff. I know that there was an environmental assessment uh, expert hired by Reticule, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so it was hired by Reticle who's providing the council with that report? No, he's working with the, the Cataraqui Conservation Authority and the relevant uh, government levels to make sure that we're, we understand where the environmentally protected area is and we don't conduct any activities in that that aren't allowed. Okay, so I guess my question is sort of following along the lines of that, um, would Reticle be willing to uh, provide, say, council with money to hire an independent expert who basically doesn't come in, and you're a lawyer, you'll understand the term of a hired gun, because um, that's what might potentially happen here is, same with the noise. Uh, I, I would never advise that because you think it might potentially happen, quite frankly, and the, the people that are hired to do that type of a role are paid to provide an unbiased independent opinion, and if they start favoring their clients, they don't work. You know, it's like, it's, it's a reality, I'm sorry, but uh, if, you, if you have a specific concern or anything, maybe we could address that, but just because you think maybe, possibly, the company is not going to do their job properly because they're getting paid by a radical, that doesn't make a compelling business case to go in and hire someone, and if you don't like their opinion, then you want someone else, I'm, I'm sorry, it would be a difficult decision to make. I understand what you're saying, but I don't. I can't follow through on the logic on that. And from a municipal standpoint, we wouldn't usually ask the proponent to pay for the study that's going to critique their proposal. We no. would, similar to what was just said, we would, if we want the study, we would pay for it. Okay, not, not to, to argue uh, and go against any of the reports or anything like that, but just as a, you know, you get one report from a total independent person. And again, that does happen in courts. You, you know that. Well, not when I'm in court, it doesn't happen that way. Everybody hires their own hired gun no. when you go to court. It's a little bit different, but uh, yeah. Who, who what, pays just the so you're clear, what we're doing is we're not going, getting somebody to, to come and say reticle is great. They haven't done anything wrong. What we're getting someone to do is, is coming to say, you see that line right there? You can't cross over that line, and you can't conduct those activities over that line, so we understand where the line is, so we don't plan to put something over there. So I guess you're worried about them pretending the line is in the wrong place or something? No, no, really no. It, I'm, I'm more sort of concerned with, um, say, like the watershed, uh, uh, some of the, say, the lead pollution that happens from the, from the bullets and stuff like that. Right. That sit on the ground, they go into the watershed. Right. And so from my understanding, maybe my understanding is, is wrong, um, that you need an environmental assessment to find where that sort of watershed would lead to. And that's why we're That's where I'm things. just yeah, okay, proposing I get, I get an what you're saying, yeah. Sure, and, and those things are happening, yeah, okay. Sure, okay. And I guess just from a, from a municipal perspective, and um, Steve Day talked about, uh, and actually Bryce did too, all the, uh, the ministry's environment they've been in uh, conversation with since I think you said June or July. Uh, I know Conservation Authority as well. In fact, that's what's holding up one of these. Uh, Conservation Authority wants to see the plan uh, and have their concerns addressed. Uh, I can tell you from a municipal perspective, have you ever gone through any uh, planning act uh, changes or, or severances where, where you want to put something 
uh, you get conservation authorities involved and they bring their own planners in and they take a look at the zoning, they take a look at location, they take a look at the impact upon the watershed, the wetlands and so on, and they will not give their approval or sign off on it until they are satisfied. And, and you just can't, as a municipality, push that piece of legislation through without them signing off on it. So there is that, that, that check and balance, uh, and I'm quite comfortable with it from a, from a municipal perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, just further to that, as the landlord, we would be concerned if, concerned if the company polluted the property. We still own it. So we have a due diligence responsibility as well. Right, and I guess sort of the, with the environmental sort of question that I had also was the uh, noise impact on, on some of the animals. I mean, I know, Mayor, you uh, are, are a component of the, uh, the Trumpeter Swan program. Um, so even with the sort of lower decibels that they've been talking about, I'm, I, I'm not an expert, I don't know, but I, I would assume that would actually probably disrupt some of their patterns. But I would just like to see, a, a, like I said, an independent environmental assessment done just so we make sure that we kind of get all the you know, T's crossed and the I's dotted. Okay. Thank you. Sir? Okay, Alex Scottsdale, Airport Road again. Um, there's been a, sorry about that, there's been a few mentions uh, from Redical and the council here, Brockville and Elizabethtown Kitley about jobs, employment, uh, anywhere from 20, what was it, part-time to 40 full-time? Nobody's ever defined, and so this question is for Redical. Nobody's ever defined what these jobs will be, what type of education will be needed for these jobs, and whether or not these are your colleagues coming from the military or Ottawa, and maybe you're just going to hire a few lawn keepers and snow removal employees. Who are these people, and honestly, where are they going to be employed from? Grace, if you guys want to take a shot at that, but just be cautioned that from an economic development and jobs perspective, whether or not they bring a job from Ottawa here, and that person now works here, lives here, buys here, sells here, eats here, does all those things, or whether they move in next door to me. When somebody comes to us and says there's 40 jobs, some people will move next door, some people will commute, some people will live in the city. That's a normal process on job creation. People okay. will find their place. So, but I would just caution you about the idea that it's a bad thing if they brought their comrades. If they have expertise in their area, I would fully expect them to bring those people okay. in. And remember, that's part of what we want, is bringing people in, buying houses, buying food, buying things, living here. That's part of the process. So just be cautious about how you, you what you don't like there. But okay, and I have, I have no problems with them bringing in their military comrades because obviously the training will have to be done by trained professionals. And I just want to mention, you did mention earlier that this isn't going to be a military-style training facility, but you guys keep using the word military. I just want to put that on, on the record there. Thanks, that's great. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So and as far as the, the reference, <laughs> Bryce, uh, Steve, a reference mm -hmm. to, can you comment on the jobs? Uh, yeah, why don't I take a first stab, Steve, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. There will be some people that will have to come in that have specialized training and expertise. 100% that's true. Is that the majority of the people? I would say not. Uh, do we want to hire people from the community to do things beyond snow plowing and everything? We definitely do. C can you give some examples? Uh, for sure. There, there's people that are going to have to work in the offices. There are people that are going to do administrative work. We're looking at having a data center, which is more of a high-tech aspect, so people with computer skills. Those aren't specialized people that we need to bring in from outside the community. You know, there, there's going to be security guards, potentially, you know, things like that. There's lots. You know, I don't know, as we sit here today, each and every job we're going to need to fill, but if you had to ask me, and this is me, and again, kind of shooting from the hip here, which I always tell people not to do. If I had to guess, I would guess that between two-thirds and three-quarters of the people for the positions could be locals. So, the t yeah. could be. And, yeah, that, and that means they're not precluded by lack of training. That's what I'm trying to say. So the one-quarter, maybe, couldn't be unless you could find somebody that had a very specific skill set that happened to live in Brockville. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so now you say 20 part-time, 40 full-time. Is that the amount of jobs that you would bring or employ from Brockville, or is that the total number of jobs that this facility is going to have? 
I'll take this one, Bryce, and I'll try and be a little bit less emotional about uh, economic matters because I realize they're fairly dry. So yes, there are certainly going to be some specialist positions that, um, that can only do what we know need to get done. Um, but when we talk about the air charter service as an example, well that needs both pilots, air crew, and maintainers. I actually don't have any of those currently. So that's an example. The data center, that could employ up to 12 high-tech people to help us run a data center. The museum, you're talking curators, folks who are, who are interested in supporting museum type work. I actually don't have an exact number right now because we're working through the business plan. But what I would suggest, if we create 20 full-time jobs, let's just say we create those 20, let's even say we create 40, there's also an induced job factor that I believe is a factor of 2.5. So that's now 100 jobs. And then there is also, sorry, an indirect factor and then an induced you're, you're factor. You're going to have to explain that in layman's terms because I don't understand what you're saying here. What I'm saying How is does 20 if, turn into 100? Right, so if Reticle hires 20 new people, indirectly that is going to create X number of jobs and I believe it's two, a factor of 2.5. Then there's an induced number. This is municipal economics. I'm not an economics professor. I'm just telling you this is what we've been told. If anybody in the audience can explain that, please feel free. But we're talking 20 to 40 reticle jobs across the spectrum. I like that than 100 because I still don't understand the 100. The way that multiplier works is that if you hire somebody as a job, that person then takes that $100 of pay, goes out into the community, and buys something else. They buy a house, they buy food, they buy gasoline. That person now takes that money and goes and buys something else. It's a multiplier factor that the Ministry of uh, uh, the Ontario Ministries use. They use it in tourism jobs, they use it in industrial jobs, they use it in commercial jobs. They've got formulas that suggest from the research that says, here's where it'll pan out. We use that a lot with the economic development discussions. Um, it tells you how it affects the community. Okay. So it's a, it's a fairly well accepted idea. Here's an idea to keep uh, all the money in the community. Anyone who comes from Ottawa, they can buy our houses on Airport Road. Wow. Okay, so, and, and this isn't a question, this is just a comment to Steve. Okay, no one's discrediting what you're trying to do here. Some of us do think it's a good idea. We just don't think this is the right area because of the, the population, okay? You're challenging our livelihoods. You, you, you keep on telling us and getting all emotional about how we don't care and you're inconveniencing us, ooh, so what? This is our livelihoods. We live here, we farm here, we walk here, we play here, we have kids here, we love here. That is a huge concern to us. So I wanna make it clear That nobody wants to discredit what you're trying to do, and we all understand you want to train Canadians and keep the money here. You keep mentioning that there's four or five other options. This isn't a question for me to stand up here and allow you to answer, but if you could please elaborate on those four or five other options and why you're here. You're here tonight. You're not no. at those four or five other locations. You're here. Now, sir, that question was answered. We asked him earlier, why here? Mr. Burroughs asked it very clearly. It was no, no, I, I, was asking, I was asking, what are the other locations? Uh, but the question of why you are here, he clearly said, this is the prime option. So we've covered that question. So perhaps if we could not repeat that, maybe we'll go on to the next person. So I, I didn't mean to repeat that. I had a different twist on it, but obviously it didn't get portrayed properly. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not going to ask this question, but you need to consider, can you really honestly fit all six aspects of your project on 142 acres? You have to ask yourself that. I, I would okay. have to suggest that if they're investing the money, they think that they can. So they obviously think um, that they can by going forward with investing the money in the planning process. But if there's only 142 acres, you can't make any more unless you want to do what? Maybe buy the golf course across the road? Should that be a concern for us in the future? Hmm. Sir, perhaps we could go to the next question. You don't like my questions, do you? Well, actually, I, I just like the next question. Think about answering that for the next public meeting if, if there is. Sir, okay? we're being very generous in answering questions. Hey, ma'am. Hi. Um, I'm not that. Uh, I'm Christelle Verrier. I live on Airport Road. Um, I just want to, I, I just want to make it be very clear on what's happened. What we saw in June, kind of like villages, all that kind of stuff. That's all gone now, based on 
You're going to have a firearm, air charter, cyber section, innovation center, loyalist shooting club, and museum. Yes, ma'am. That's all you're planning now that's for the, the next plan. 15 years. That's the current plan, yeah, that's right, yeah. And that's what's going to fill in all this yellow up here. The yellow, mm -hmm. which is your proposed development, because you have all you have is the firearms now. But the uh, plan is somewhere in this yellow, somewhere, will be these other elements. Some of them possibly. Somebody uh, made a uh, suggestion tonight that we may, oh, may yes, look exactly. at and, and locating to look at other, other parts otherwise. Yeah, but, but some people think some people think there's not enough room. Some people think no, but it's just that we're still mixing up what we saw in June yep. with all these things, with the um, doing training underground, uh, so you can had a rail June. thing. Yeah, you can forget June. Because June is completely off the be, table. Because June, the plan progressed from June based on the information we got. That's right. So now we're showing you what the current plan is. Yes. So, so my question, that, well, not even question, but um, because we're only seeing, I would say, I guess, phase one, which is the firearms. That's all we see right here, right? Yeah. And well, phase two, the future of phase two, which is fairly recent, I guess, coming up. And, and the, then um, there's buildings on there, so not everything happens outside. So yeah, okay. So yeah, I'm with you so far. But go ahead. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just making sure. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the shift now, and that's where I just want to be clear that the shift has is completely 180 degrees from June to now. I think the plan is the same, but it's been scaled back considerably and it's been modified. So. Well, because I don't remember seeing an innovation center. I don't remember seeing a museum in June. You're or, right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's so, why I'm yeah, saying that. hundred percent. Yeah, I agree with you. It's changed. And I, that's why I tried to walk you through the changes and the processes we've been going through. But there, you're hundred percent right. There's definitely been changes. Yeah. So I just want to be sure, be clear. Yeah, sure. That's fine. So again, as we, as we've said the reason we exposed everything in June, it was a blue sky approach. Yeah, and agreed. we didn't want, as Bryce had talked about earlier, something coming, someone coming back after the fact saying, oh, you never told us about this. We came in with a blue sky approach, engaged the community, are listening to your feedback, but some things are also business proprietary information. I was not about to expose a museum in June because I only announced it at a national commemoration last week. We were not talking about the Innovation Centre in June because it's a business decision. Mm -hmm. And we are partnering with a national um, defence and um, uh, security and defence uh, association. And those are business confidential things that I can't share with you. And I won't share with you because it's no, business confidential. But the, the, um, all I'm saying is that the focus is completely different. No, the focus is not uh, completely different. The focus, again, is a plan for first responders, law enforcement and select national security So we'll security still have actors. the villages will be developed on here. So when we sat down last December with the local civic leaders, I talked about two things. An air charter service, which is on this drawing, yeah. and a first in Canada training centre. Scale scope to yet to be defined. We've worked through that over 10 months. Maybe we overreached initially, we're bringing it back to earth, and we're trying to work through this process. If this was easy, somebody else would have done it. We are just slowly working our way through this, trying to engage the community, hearing your feedback, adjusting as we go. Okay, and that's, and that's okay in those, the priority stuff. I guess what I'm trying to say is you must have eventually a full-blown plan, which can modify slightly, but you have a general plan overall, and you're gonna have it in a phased-in approach. I just know from Pitts and Quarries, they have these big ideas, it's a 20-year plan, but they phase it in, so that they, but they can plan, they can determine what the traffic issues it can be because they have the overall plan, but they can phase it in. And they'll say, well, at phase two, we have to deal with the, these traffic issues now because there's enough whatever. So I'm just, I'm just getting, I just, the more you can show that you are actually having an overall plan that is going to be approved overall first off and then have phases that things happen would be much easier for us to know, understand, accept, if you wish, than, well, we're just doing the firing range now and we're not going to show anything else yet because we don't want to let anyone know anything else. That, just so you see from our side, our perspective of things. Okay? Yes, ma'am. The other question, I do have one question to the city of Brockville um, as part of your lease. Will you have an insurance bond to make sure that environmental impacts, if any, 
will be covered in case this whole thing falls through after they start. We would have in place all normal insurances that we would have with a typical tenant. We would have it uh, with anybody else who would have the potential for industrial waste. We would have it uh, in this case, whatever is anticipated, it's a normal landlord tenant relationship. Okay, thank you. So. Sure. Yep. Hi, I'm George Moore. Uh, I'm a 45, 25 airport road. That's about near, near Susan Drive. Uh, anyways, I've got a question about the air traffic that's going to be coming in. And just how loud are these planes going to be? Uh, how, how many are coming in? We're caucusing. Bryce, Steve, uh, comment. We do, and keep in mind so far the discussion has been that these planes are uh, smaller aircraft, not the bigger ones. Correct. And it is already, uh, the facility already allows jet engines and helicopters. So. Uh, we're not talking about those right now, though. No. We're talking about fixed wing aircraft with propellers that are based out of here, that get the work done on them, that get repaired, that fly away to do work, that fly back and go in their hangar and get fixed. So it's Yeah, but as, it, so as they come in, I mean, you're talking about pretty big planes, some of them. Not, no, sir. No. Not, that's no, no, sorry. And I no. guess one of the concerns from uh, us as the airport owner has traditionally been over the last couple of years that the site is underutilized and it's, it's not paying the way. We need more volume just to pay the bills of the site. So it has been our goal to try and get more volume for some time, and, and that was part of the whole expand the runway process, which did not result in the volume that was anticipated. Mm -hmm. So. All right. Uh, <clears throat> no one behind me. <laughs> you got her. <laughs> Look, I think you're interested in this. Uh, I'd like to see a show of hands of how many people are interested in things as they are right now. Sorry, could you repeat that? I'd could we have a show of hands to see how many people are interested in this thing but at, at, in Redicle, getting involved here as it is right now? It give you an idea as to how much more progress we think you need to make. Do, do you mean support the project? Yes, yeah, uh, well, to, to support it just the way it is right now. W would people be willing to put their hands up if they were interested? I would suggest that I might be wrong, but this crowd would We're not probably, voting. Probably not we're not voting. <laughs> you know, really, like, I, I, I wouldn't put my hand up right now, and the way it is. Anybody want to? <laughs> Fair enough. Not. All right. Other questions? My name is Beverly York from Airport Road, and I have a question for Redicle. What guarantees can you give the property owners and residents in Tin Cap, and for that matter, all Canadians, that no undesirable and or misguided individual person or persons will receive any training or be allowed to use your training facility? Um, wow. I can tell you that the people that are behind Reticle are mostly ex-military people, Canadian soldiers, and the clients that we are going to serve are going to be Canadian first responders, Canadian police officers, uh, Canadian service members and potentially allies such as Brits and Americans and they will be vetted, they will be uh, required through their own chains of command or institutions to, to, to come to us as people who are already vetted and experts. So we're not in the business of helping the bad guys, like seriously. <laughs> no, yeah. because we know where to find you. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, and it uh, refers to Blackwater, and it's um, in, directed to Redico. Blackwater. Um, Blackwater, and for those of you here who are not familiar with Blackwater, out of the United States, 
In short, it is a specialized military type training facility, such as Reticle Ventures. And it is, or was, by all accounts, a mercenary organization working for the US State Department and is now called Academy. Furthermore, it is my understanding that select Canadian soldiers have been sent there in the past and possibly still are for specialized training. So, Reticle, I ask you, are you anticipating to garner clients from Blackwater or Academy? And rather than our Canadian soldiers going there, will they be attending your military type training center here in Tin Cap and at any given time for training? Thank you. No plans whatsoever to ever have anybody from Blackwater come here because they are not the types of people that we would be having training. No, I didn't suggest people from Blackwater, but uh, the, the people from the Canadians that are being trained at Blackwater. There are you a, hoping to garner them and bring them here? There could be some people. Okay, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I've been down to Blackwater uh, Academy, Mid-South, Thunder Ranch, any number of the training facilities in the U.S. Been down there many times. Um, the vast majority of our law enforcement go down to those exact same facilities. The vast majority of our national security actors who need training go down to those facilities because those facilities provide world-class training to people who are paid to protect us. So again, I come back, I'm trying to repatriate some of that money back here to Canada, and if I look at the 38 TAC teams, tactical teams in Ontario. These are your local law enforcement departments that are mandated today to do two 40 week, sorry, 40 hour concentrations of training a year. Guess what? They are not getting the training because the training is only available in the US and they cannot afford neither the time away from their shifts nor the exchange rate on the Canadian dollar to go down there and get trained. So when I talk about Mayor Thorpe and Moncton and these different situations, these frontline officers are paying the price because there is no training facility in Canada to train them. The other issue with Blackwater, you hit the nail on the head. It is a mercenary or was a mercenary organization. We are not a mercenary organization. We will not conduct any type of operations on behalf of the Government of Canada because that is the remit of the professionals. We are here to help enable, which means make possible, or facilitate, which means make easier their training and, and what they need to have done. So Blackwater, Mid-South, Thunder Ranch, these are just a number of them. I'm very familiar with all of them. We are trying to bring some of that money back to Canada, invest it here in this region, and enable these frontline officers who cannot get out of the province to get the training they so desperately need. And again, we are not a mercenary organization. I will have absolutely nothing to do with that. Thank you. Okay, um, sir, I think we're, you're going to be the last question because uh, we're getting late and uh, yep. we've no, I, really run out the, uh, the questions for a bit, so what have you got? I completely understand that. Now, I don't have the details on this, but I have heard from a friend I have on the, mil uh, the police force here in Brockville that there are training facilities for the RCMP, the OPP, and the Brockville police. So that eliminates the police force out of what you're saying. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Steve, just wait. So I just want to mention that, that there is mention of that from somebody within the Brockville Police Force. Um, answer that in two seconds. I don't remember your name. Bryce Joffrey. Bryce, Alex. Man to man, you made a comment about the airplanes being loud around here. I'm out in my property doing my yard work. My two children are running around playing, okay, even right now in the leaves, laying on their back. They yell at me, Daddy, Daddy, there's an airplane. Hmm, I didn't even hear the airplane breaking my leaves because they are not that loud. You don't know that unless you live here 24 seven. They're not that loud. What you're okay. proposing will be. So Steve, back to my first question, if you could answer that, please. Yeah, uh, Alex, I, I've, I've lost it. If you could just restate, okay. please. So I have a friend on the Brockville Police right. Force okay, and he it. has assured I'm, me. I'm good, okay. I'm good. So if, if that was in fact a, 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 a statement, and I don't discount the frontline officer saying that, why is it the reticle has in its possession letters, emails, correspondence from national police forces, local police forces supporting this initiative? 
by supporting it, do you mean supporting it because they have nothing or do they just want something better than what they have? I no, don't understand what you said, mean. As I already stated, in Ontario alone, there are tactical teams that are not meeting the mandated requirements by the government of Ontario because there are no facilities. Can, Point finale. Can you make these communications public to us? Uh, no, I won't because it's again business confidential and when I get a government agency providing me information, it's incumbent on me to hold that. Will I make them available to the elected representatives? I absolutely will. Okay, thank you. And, uh, one thing to keep, no, I think we, we cut it off after the line. So something different. Not well, question. last question. Comment, uh, so no one others after you, we're gonna, otherwise we're just gonna keep covering some same ground. But Alex, a quick, quick comment to what you said. Keep in mind is it's one thing to question what might happen near your property, sound, danger, all those things. But as far as the business plan and the market that they cater to, that's a business risk that the proponents are taking. If their business model fails, that's what happens in business. That's their risk. So for us to question what their market is, it's not our job. That's their job. It's their job to figure out, is it worth investing money in and potentially losing money? That's their job. So we just have to separate the discussion to really find out what, what we have to look at. Okay, last question. I'm okay, sorry. Uh, from Mayor Pickard. I was wondering, uh, you talk, went to great pains it seemed, uh, talking about the zoning change, and nobody really said, came to any meetings or anything. Sorry, I got a cold. Uh, but um, you seem like right now that, uh, you didn't know anything about this in 2013 when the zoning change came, right? So nobody did. So, how would we, like, so nobody really knew something of the scope was going to come up. Do, would you really expect it? Like if this, if you're making the zoning change right now, wouldn't you expect this kind of crowd instead of nobody when you made the change? Um, I'm not sure where you're going with that question. Okay, let's well, see. all right. Um, but they made the zoning change like uh, that. Okay, this here will fit the airport now because of what zoning changes. But nobody showed up in 2013 about the zoning change because we thought, well, it was no big deal. There's just a little zoning change. But like the paper said, like it's a training facility, not a dance studio. So like that is a big difference. So like, um, so wouldn't you expect more people to show up now? If you're making that change right now, you'd be getting these kind of crowds crushed right into your council chambers uh, instead of nobody showing up. So I mean, it's really not fair to put it on us saying that, well, nobody came to the council meetings in 2013 uh, when we made this change, when nobody knew that this kind of, kind of something that the scope would even be thought of being allowed in the airport. The zoning changes I was referring to was a zoning bylaw change throughout the municipality. It was not specific to the airport. It had to do with residential uh, development as well. It had to do with industrial development. It was a, a, a zoning bylaw change that we go through and as we do with the official plan every five years. Uh, it wasn't targeted or specific to the airport. All I'm saying is that there was a um, a comment made at a council meeting, uh, and that's why I addressed it here, but a comment made at the council meeting basically saying um, that you didn't tell us that you were going to do this. I'm saying, yes, you were notified. Uh, as a matter of fact, 2011, 2012, and 2013, there were uh, interim tax bill inserts notifying of the, of the upcoming zoning bylaw changes. But it wasn't specific just to the airport. That was just one small part of the whole zoning bylaw change. So it had to do with residences, uh, size of lots, a whole number of issues, which, I'll be honest with you, I can't tell you off the top of my head what it all covered. But it was not just the airport. That was one, just one piece of the, of the whole zoning bylaw change. Yeah, well, that's, that's why I referenced it. Yeah, we just seem to be minimizing the fact that oh, no. uh, the nobody showed up about it. Because no. like nobody would show up because it's just like standard well, business. You 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 are you are taking what I said and twisting to this specific instance. What I said was is in response to the comments that why why didn't you tell us that this was going to change? And I'm just saying that there were all these notifications that we we're going through the zoning bylaw change process. 
I'm not being critical of the public because quite frankly, uh, it can become a bit of a yawner uh, for, for some of these zoning bylaw changes. If you're talking, well, I'm gonna take my residence, I'm gonna go from two and a half uh, hectares minimum a lot size down to two hectares, but under special conditions down to one and three quarter hectare. That type of discussion was going on. And I wasn't, I wasn't being critical of the people for not showing up, not at all. I was trying to clarify because there was a misconception that they had not been notified. And I was just trying to advise that yes, you had been notified. Okay. The whole change, that's all. I want to kind of clear that up because that's what it sounded like to me. You were kind of criticizing the residents for not showing up. Be, being a politician, I'm not going to talk down to the public. Yeah, maybe. Uh, okay. For Mayor Henderson, though, but you um, were talking about the uh, noise and like, but I you know like, you know had had cement plant that didn't pass in Rockville because the residents didn't like the noise and dust and everything else coming from it. But now you seem to be saying, okay, well let's sort of Elizabeth Town and let them have it, like something noisy and <laughs> dirty and dusty. What's the difference? Like, uh, I, I mean, I know you in Rockville, like you, like in Rockville and Elizabeth Town are working together on this and it might be a good idea but still just seems like uh like something that doesn't like pass in brockville well that sounds like it might be all right for elizabeth town toss something like in that same type of dirty stuff uh why not it's not actually brockville. well unfortunately the example you're citing about the asphalt plant in brockville it went through a process it was turned down we have multiple other similar type situations that don't get turned down. We're going through one in the northwest quadrant of the city right now. It's a similar discussion. It's not getting turned down. We're doing all the homework. We're going through the process. There is not the same type of discussion about the project. It's in all likelihood going to go through. There are people that are unhappy with it. That's not the first time. There are other situations that are exactly the same. Every situation is different. Every situation has different arguments and discussions. Some have more strength to their arguments than others. Uh, so, you know, and in this case, in this facility, uh, this is a property that we own that's an airport, and they need an airport. So why is it there, and why do we encourage it there? Because we subsidize a commercial property on that spot that is supposed to be busier has been expanded to be busier, is zoned for commercial activity, it lands helicopters and jets now, it's not as busy as it, it's supposed to be. It's, you know, it should be more. So as far as what's our role, it makes sense for jobs to be there. And in the bigger sense of things, everybody in this room has a very connected position to this facility. You live close to it. But there are people out there that those jobs are critical to. The economy around here is critical to them. It's a balance. We try to make decisions that mitigate the damage, but are for the overall good. We do the same thing as the Council of Elizabethtown does. This happens to be a property that we own, so we're participating in it. Okay, well, let me comment. That's uh, one last thing there. Just, uh, you're talking about property values and uh, not going down because of the noise. I mean, you, know, you moved in the airport, you're expecting noise, but the noise at the airport is one this size, is you get the small planes, even the small jets come in. I mean, the noise comes in, it's fade, uh, they land, it fades out, they take off, it fades out. It's no big deal, even a helicopter just comes in and fades out. We're not talking about eight, 10, 12 hours a day, whatever, a constant 40 decibel, 80 decibel shooting, and this is only preliminary. You're saying that's what's gonna be coming now is like 45 caliber shooting or whatever but who's saying that it's not gonna be getting up to the sniper rifles down the road or any other kind of training. I mean, this just seems like it's way too preliminary and nothing is being shown that what's gonna happen down the road and like somebody said, to get the foot in the door and then you're gonna do what you want and Brockville's gonna say, good, we got tax money, they're coming in, rent. Elizabeth Town's gonna to say, good, we got tax money coming in. Ah, oh, so what, 50, 100 people don't like it, screw them. Like that's what it comes down to. And I'm on there for it. So well, thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna close it down for the night. Uh, no, sir, I said we, we agreed that, nobody else stood up, so let's move on. We, we did agree it, nobody else was standing there. Okay. Guys, last one. Let's, let's work with this, because you can't be here all night. Go ahead. To the microphone. Do you have a plan for the next noise test? 
No, there is no, no next noise test plan. Ever? Well, we, we wow. have to build it uh, at, and put in the mitigation measures, so it, unless or until we get so to that So we stage. have to go through a build, as you're saying, first before we can do a noise test? You can do yeah. a noise test whenever you like if you get the permission of the property owner, but we've done everything we needed to do to modify the plan to try to mitigate the noise for the residents. So Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to turn the mic over to Mayor Pickard. Uh, I, this is uh, the crowd here is... Uh, very concerned about the issues. I think you understand where we're coming from. You may not agree with what we're trying to do, but we are making them. The comment that, uh, that we don't care wouldn't be fair because everybody that lives out here interacts with the city on an ongoing basis, whether you work or you shop or you do something down there. So it's very close. So this, the things that we are doing are, we believe, in the common good. We have committed to working with the township on it. So. Thank you, Mayor Henderson. I think, first of all, I want to thank uh, you for coming and, and, and attending. I, I, I see a lot of familiar faces here, uh, people that I know, but also people that I have seen in, in, uh, in our council. And the concern was that you weren't getting the information. You've received the information. You may not agree with it, and certainly that's your prerogative, and certainly it is now uh, going to be incumbent upon uh, both uh, Brockville and the township to start making some decisions once a formal site plan uh, agreement has been has been filed uh, with the municipality for their review. Uh, there are still some other issues. Uh, one issue I've already talked about uh, with CRCA and uh, Mr. Day is well aware of that with the one building. So it, it's, it's still a process that's ongoing. It's a process you have to work through the bureaucracy. But I'm, I, I, there is also one meeting coming up, and, and, and uh, Dave talked about it, uh, and that's the, with Transport Canada. And that is what the proposal is that you have heard tonight, what impact that will have on airport operations. I cannot tell you. I do have uh, some knowledge of how the airport functions, and, and I have some knowledge with respect to instrument flights in and out of this airport. Um, but that will be Transport Canada's decision, and uh, theirs alone. Uh, I hope you've got the answers, not all of them. I, I'm sure you haven't got all your answers. I hope you've got some that you walk away from the meeting, at least have a better idea and concept of what is being proposed. And we, as a municipality, and Dave's municipality and council, will have to go through their due diligence and their process in order to uh, make a decision as to how this progresses or not. So with those few words, thank you for coming. We appreciate you taking the time to, to spend with us this evening. Uh, I think there were some good questions, good comments, and uh, let's see where we go from here. And uh, there will be other council meetings, of course, as well. Thank you all for coming and have a good evening.